the Bellevue City Council meeting for July 26, 2021. It's a beautiful evening tonight. We have a lot of material to go over, so I'm hoping we can, after we uh, honor Police Chief Milet, I hope we can keep our comments down to three minutes max at a time. Um, Clerk, could you do the roll call, please? Yes, Mayor Robinson. Here. Deputy Mayor Newenhouse. Here. Councilmember Barksdale. Here. Councilmember Lee. Here. Councilmember Robertson. I'm here. Councilmember Stokes. Here. And Councilmember Zahn. <clears throat> here. Thank you. Councilmember Robertson, could you lead us in the flag salute, please? Certainly. Would everyone please join me as we salute the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States of America, America and to the Republic, to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, stands one nation, one nation under, God, under God, God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice. justice. Thank you. So we have a commendation for our Chief Milet, who's leaving us, unfortunately, but we all I think have a lot to say and thanks and gratitude to him. And I'm gonna have Council Member Robertson read the commendation and then we'll all have a chance to speak. Council Member Robertson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, whereas Steve Milet has provided vital service to the city of Bellevue for six years, serving as chief of police since 2015. And whereas Chief Milet implemented the tomorrow's program Shortly after arriving in Bellevue, which created seven advisory councils to the chief, which represented communities based on race, ethnicity, religion, and sexual orientation. This program significantly strengthened relationships with Bellevue's diverse communities and improved access and communications with residents and businesses. And whereas through his tenure, the chief continuously challenged systems within the police department and instituted changes where necessary, to ensure the Bellevue Police Department was providing the best service possible. And whereas during his time, Chief Milet elevated employee wellness and recognition to a top priority. This included quarterly and yearly award presentations recognizing outstanding employee service. The chief also created a new employee wellness program, assigning a sergeant to oversee the unit, giving staff access to critical health and financial information. And whereas Chief Milet also helped navigate the police department and the city of Bellevue's engagement in the social justice movement over the past year, the programs referenced above allowed for open dialogue and swift participation in these critical issues. Now, therefore, on behalf of Mayor Lynn Robinson and on behalf of the Bellevue City Council, do hereby this 26th day of July in the year 2021, hereby commend Stephen L. Milet for his professionalism, dedication, and service to the community and the Bellevue Police Department. We wish him the best in his future endeavors. And that's signed, Mayor Lynn Robinson. Thank you very much. Deputy Mayor, would you like to start us off? Uh, certainly, Mayor, thank you. Well, um, Steve, can we change your mind still? Is that possible? <laughs> Don't <want> me. <laughs> You're killing me. Oh, uh, well, listen, uh, on a serious note, you know, police officers put their lives on the line every day to keep us, our families and our community safe. They put themselves directly into situations most of us would, quite frankly, run away from and see things on a, on a daily basis that most people would rather not think about, let alone have to deal with. And a chief is no different. Chief Milet, thank you for serving the city of Bellevue and its residents with dedication, commitment, and honor over these last six years. And what a six years it's been for you and your department. Um, you know, some of those highlights as um, Council Member Robertson uh, just mentioned uh, in the commendation, um, but some of the things that will always stand out for me was your community-based policing approach, your outreach to minorities in our city, assuring immigrants that this department would never ask a victim, witness, or suspect for their immigration status, you know, developing a department more diverse and engaged with, its, with the community that it serves, restoring the bike patrol, reorganizing the department into geographic sectors, 
forming those different advisory uh, councils, such as for uh, African Americans, Muslim, Latino, LGBTQI, Asia Pacific Islander, and South Asian as well, knowing and caring about every officer in this department who put on a uniform and pushing back loudly against racism stemming from the pandemic against our Asian residents, letting them know loud and clear that uh, that was not going to be tolerated in our city. You know, these are some of the highlights that I will always remember of your time serving this, serving this city. And I think you've served with distinction. You've been a steady hand at the wheel for this department during sometimes some very challenging times. And uh, I couldn't wish you um, a, a better transition to, to Akron. And um, I'm sure you weren't able to accomplish everything you set your mind to uh, when you first took this job. And I'm sure there's, um, there's still a long to-do list that uh, um, uh, Intern Chief uh, Shirley uh, will probably be looking at and talking to you um, over the next couple of months about. But you know, I think by every measure, you have left this department in a much better place than when you found it. And um, you know, the city of Akron is lucky to have you, and I'm sure that your tenure there will be as successful as it has been here in Bellevue. So my best wishes to you, to your family, and your new adventure in Ohio. But please, please don't become a Buckeyes fan. <laughs> Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Council Member Lee. Hi, Chief. Hi, Councilman. Yeah, we have, I'm very disappointed that you are a short term. Uh, <laughs> and um, as you probably know, everybody knows, uh, public safety, you know, for the city of Bellevue, for me, for the council, is the number one priority, the most important. Uh, people look at uh, police department, our public safety, as the responsibility of a government, because we cannot depend on individual military protections, you have a bunch of militia. And so it's uh, essential, no question. And uh, we've been very fortunate in Bellevue, you know, over my 50 some years living here, we are under such a wonderful, wonderful department with great people. And so as I, you know, we look for a new person, new chief, we have done so, you know, a, a few times, not that many, uh, it's a major responsibility. We always look for the best. And uh, indeed, you know, we were very fortunate that we found you. <laughs> so you are a police officer's police chief. That's most important. When you have somebody new from the outside, you know, usually it takes time to adjust and people don't know, you know, you and uh, the new chief. It takes a long time of period of adjustment. But you came on, and uh, it's uh, just uh, work writing smoothly because you have demonstrated your experience and background. I uh, just fetching, you know, like uh, hands a glove, and I think it's proven to be the case. And uh, I think you have the respect of your uh, fellow officers. There's nothing that can replace that, mm -hmm. and uh, obviously you have respect of the management, and you have our respect. You know, we are elected by the people. And hopefully, you know, we uh, know where they come from and we believe that you have equal uh, respect and you've done a great job before uh, so, You know, during your tenure, you've established a number of new programs, you know, such as the community uh, outreach and having representatives from various diverse community groups, as uh, Deputy Mayor mentioned. And, um, uh, you know, the biggest challenge we face now is really how to include, how to communicate, how to bring people into uh, most important, uh, you know, part of our city. And the most important part, again, is safety, public safety. And especially for immigrant population, they traditionally look at police officers as, well, the enforcer, you know, they scare about you and they stay away from you. But we have continued and you have having this, uh, you know, the ethnic minority uh, council on board. And that really had sort of walked the talk. You bring people uh, into the police department, establish communication. And second, you have increased, hired uh, diverse police officers. Absolutely. And it's not easy because it's against a community that traditionally don't look at law enforcement as something 
that is very friendly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so you, you have absolutely uh, improved the, uh, the makeup. And uh, uh, so we are very sorry, especially the last year, we, are, we have gone through such a tremendous stress uh, on our law enforcement officers. And you have kept up, you have been very sensitive and uh, we have proven, uh, we, we had a one, one night challenge, but you know, since then we had a wonderful, peaceful, uh, you know, you, uh, for the city of Bellevue. So it's proven, proven your leadership, proven uh, what you have done to the department. And I think with what you have set up, it actually points out to another improvement is the, uh, uh, I would call the uh, community policing. You know, I think you definitely emphasize that. And that's the direction. Uh, I, when I was in the council uh, almost 30 years ago, we talk about that. That's really the very basic fundamental policing is community <coughs> policing. It's beat officers. You're part of the community, making the community safe, uh, right? And helping the community know that you are there to protect them when you are needed. So I thank you for starting that, laying that foundation. And I wish you the best. And we are, we're sorry to see you go, obviously. No question about it. Uh, but I, we realize that, however, it's a lot more important also to be with the family. That's the priority. And you are also demonstrated. You are set a good example. Show your wisdom and your priority. So we understand, appreciate it. So best of everything, best of luck with your family. And I hope you do find time to visit us because we're still the best region, best city in the country. So I'm sure you'll come a bit to us. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, sir. Thank you. Council Member Stokes. Yeah, Chief, um, it's, it's been a fascinating relationship and uh, partnership. You came in when I was mayor and um, right away, um, well, two things I really remember from that time period. One is going with you uh, to the mosque in Bellevue and uh, talking to people there on a Saturday and uh, ended up having lunch with them. And you talked about recruitment. You talked about yourself. You talked about your religion and Bellevue and brought the message that, you know, the police are for all citizens and we're, you know, we're partners. And um uh, then the most amazing thing was, I was sitting in the back row back there, and um, you actually participated in, in the whole process. And, and, and I don't know, I might have not been able to get up off, you know, from the posture, but uh, I mean, that was just so amazing that you uh, related so much to everybody and to people, and not, not just to that community, but others as well. And, you know, we've gone to several, went to several meetings and dinners and things at the mosque and other places, and you brought other officers with you. Um, and I think that was a real positive start and a start on Bellevue really going forward in our identity of making our Bellevue welcomes the world, their diversity, our strength actually means something. Thank you. And I won't forget that. Um, the other, well, I won't forget the night of the fire and being called at six o'clock in the morning to come down to the Starbucks and uh, across the street. And you were there and the FBI was there and the police were there and everybody and we went over and uh, you really made a trem tremendous impact on that. Again, in the whole community, not just the Muslim community, but the whole community about your commitment and how you actually carry out the job. I mean, you know, I, I appreciate all of the, uh, and didn't leave as much to say, but the people who have talked, you know, council members beforehand really laid out, uh, you know, the whole piece of what you've done. And it's just amazing. But I just want to add to that uh, because I worked with you on a very, uh, you know, good uh, personal level and, and official level as well. And I just haven't seen anybody in your job and, and this type of thing uh, carry it the way you do. And then to come through and help us get through this um, after the George, um, uh, uh, why can't I think? Lloyd. George Lloyd. I always have trouble with names. George Lloyd, George Lloyd 
event well, and kneeling with the with the Black Lives Matter people, working with the community, working with the store owners, working with other everybody to make that again. You brought it together and made it really work, and that says a lot for you. Uh, you. you know, it, it's just amazing, and I'm personally uh, I'm very pleased that you're going where you think you need to be at this point and we all have to do that at times i'm very um sad to not uh, have you around and be be able to work with you but you're going to be a great police uh, chief for akron and you've been a great police chief for bellevue and we will never forget you and i'll always be in my heart and i just um these are always hard but but on the other hand it's a happy occasion because you're going to go and do even more amazing things in another place. Thank but you thank very you. much. Thank you very much, sir. I, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Council Member Robertson. Thanks. Well, the, the three council members who spoke before me stole my notes, apparently. <laughs> um, so I'll, and I'll, I'll keep it brief. We've got a really heavy agenda, but I did. I definitely wanted to speak and say thank you for your service to Bellevue. I think police officers have one of the hardest jobs um, you know, in the world and leading a police force is right up there with one of the more difficult jobs and one of the more important jobs we have. It's one of the most important positions for the city of Bellevue. As uh, Councilmember Lee said, public safety is critical um, to, to having a wonderful livable community. And during your tenure, you have strengthened the department. You've strengthened them from within. You've strengthened their reputation from without, uh, not just in Bellevue, but across the region. I have people that to comment on what a great police chief we have and how wonderful you, you've made the city look. You also have strengthened the relationships with our community and you strengthened the leadership and connections internally at City Hall with between the police department and the other departments, including the council. So, um, you know, as, as someone said, uh, you left the department stronger than you found it. You've really enhanced and elevated the department and the city's reputation. And so I, I can't thank you enough for all the, I know what it's not a 40 hour a week job, it's probably not even an 80 hour a week job, but all the extra time, care and consideration that you've given to this position and to the, to the men and women of the department and to the people of this city. So I'm, I'm just so grateful for your service. I'm sorry to see you go, but of course, I wish you the best of luck for you and your family. I know you're gonna be successful. I hope you find Ohio to be a wonderful place to live and in a good department to lead. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we don't be a stranger. Um, and we'll be, we'll be watching for you to continue doing great things, um, which I'm sure will get, maybe even get picked up in the papers here. So um, really, it's just been an honor to work with you and I wish you well. Thank you so very much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. So Chief, I, I know you're anxious to settle in a place where you can gather your entire family around you. And you told us that was a value you had three years ago, but we asked you or begged you to stay, myself in particular, and you did. And because you stayed, you're here during COVID, you're here during Black Lives Matter, for our anti-Asian hate rallies, the May 31st unrest and every other community event that we've had here in Bellevue. And throughout those times, you have been a partner and a servant to our entire community. I've heard you say amen to our residents. I've seen you take a knee. I've witnessed your involvement and a dedication to our res residents. Um, you've been a guiding force and a source of strength for me and many others. I just want to thank you for always being present and available, for continually growing in this evolving role that you've had, and for just doing an excellent job. I appreciate you. I'm going to miss you very much, and I wish you well. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so very much. Um, Mayor? Mayor? Uh, yeah, are we all going to get a chance to speak? Yeah. Yeah. We didn't go around. I'm Oh, well, sorry. No, we're still going around. I'm going in order of seniority on the council. So uh, council member is on, you are next. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry about that. Steve, thank you so much. You know, leading in law enforcement now 
is so, so hard. And I so appreciate the fact that uh, you chose Bellevue six years ago uh, to be our police chief. You know, when I think about you, I think about the fact that you were there for the community and leading by example for the department about what leadership looks like. I still remember the first time we met, you talked about the guardian view of policing versus in the past, it was always about warriors that may be intimidating to the community versus part of the community. And I always remember that. So by the time I came, you know, four years ago, you had already created the advisory councils and a lot of the, the programs that really grow the department, the relationship with the community. And so I thank you for that. Um, for me though, the parts I will remember the most is what council member Stokes talked about of being in the, the mosque fire and the 500 people all squished into Sammamish High School. And it really does highlight the fact that you are there when the community needs you. And our police officers are there as well. I remember all of the community events where we always had police officers there to be part of the community. And also, um, I remember the last minute uh, text that I sent to you saying that in the Chinatown International District, there was gonna be a big dinner and part of it was trying to figure out how to recruit from the Chinese community. And at the last minute, you had someone come and, and connect with the community there, right? So part of that is, is showing up and being there even um, at the last minute. And a couple of other things that I really thought about was when we had the shooting near Stevenson Elementary and the community was so concerned that you brought your police officers and had several meetings with the community, really helping them understand how you're gonna, how to keep them safe and public safety. Uh, the fentanyl one at Bellevue High School, when communities are so concerned about an issue that continues to happen in our community. And you could have just sent your officers, you were there personally. And that to me is very, very meaningful and it's part of leadership. So I will just tell you that I, I wish you well. It sounds like um, going to Ohio gives you a chance to be hopefully closer to family. And I would just tell you my message that I sent to um, a fellow council member that I served together at the National League of Cities, Russell Neal with the Akron um, City Council. And what I said to him is that I believe Chief Milet would le will lead with heart while addressing the tough challenges of policing in the 21st century and ensuring public safety is for all. And to me, that's that's what you brought to Bellevue. And I hope that um, Akron sees the, the benefits of having you there as well as they go through uh, the challenges of law enforcement and policing in their city. So thank you, Chief, for all your efforts and we will miss you very much and uh, wish you well, don't be a stranger. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member, thank you so very much. Council Member Barksdale. All right, thank you, Mayor. Um, Chief, thank you. Uh, as everyone else has said for your service and leadership, really appreciate how you engaged in the community and made sure that community policing was uh, meant everyone in the community. Um, and I, what I'll remember most are our conversations um, around race and policing and really appreciate um, not just your openness, but also I think, you know, I would say inviting that conversation and that curiosity that you had. So I really appreciated that. I mean, it meant a lot. Um, so I know carrying, uh, you'll carry that forward into Akron and, um, and it'll be welcomed with open arms. So I just want to say congratulations. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, before you stop, before you say your piece, Ms. Uh, Chief, I'm going to let Mr. Miyake weigh in if you don't mind. So thank you, Mayor. And uh, many nice things have been said about you, Steve, which, you know, I'm sure all of us agree with. But I just wanted to say on behalf of the city's executive leadership team, we want to thank you for your tremendous contribution to not only the team, but also to the city. You know, from a citywide perspective, we are grateful for, you know, Steve's unwavering support of the organization's one city culture and for embracing the city's core values of stewardship, commitment to employees, innovation, integrity, and exceptional public service. Steve will definitely be missed by the organization, and he truly leaves the organization in a better place when he got here, as many of you mentioned. So, so thank you, Steve, and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Um, I, 
Humbled is not the word. I don't know what the word is, if there's a stronger word than humbled, but I am, <clears throat> I'm very humbled by all of your, all, all of your kind words. This is, this is, I'm conflicted. I really am, because I really think that Bellevue is a very, very special place. And it has been my true privilege and honor and the highlight of my career getting to work here in this city, in this community with some phenomenal people. Uh, Mayor, you and the council and the councils before you have shown me nothing but support. Um, you have been open to ideas and, and given me just so much leeway to lead. And I cannot thank you all enough for that. When I've ever asked for anything, this council has said yes. You've said yes to public safety. You've said yes to the men and women of, the, of this police department. You said yes to the community that we're gonna provide the best services possible across the board, across the entire city, but certainly in policing. And that was, I, I can't tell you how, how much I appreciated that and continue to appreciate it. Brad, you're, you hired me. I don't know, you saw something, um, and I thank you, I really do. <clears throat> I'm gonna miss your leadership, I'm gonna miss your friendship. Um, I'm, gonna miss, I'm gonna miss so much. And you and I will have a private conversation um, about this that I won't um, talk about here, but thank you. To my colleagues on the leadership team, I, from the time I landed here to the, this one, again, the teamwork, this is not, it's not normal, I'll tell you that. This is the, and especially this team that we have right now, that Brad, you have, you have cultivated. Um, I am so honored to serve along each and every one of you. Um, and I thank you for all the support that you've given me personally. Um, the Bellevue community, you welcomed me, you supported me, you listened, you engaged, you let me in your homes, you let me in, your, in, your, in the mosque, in the churches, in, in whatever aspect in your lives. You invited me and my employees into your lives, and I'm forever in your debt. I will miss you all. To the men and women of this police department, you are, you are some of the best police officers and civilian staff in municipal government. You, you work from a mindset of community policing. Your heart is noble. You, you, do, you do the work that is expected of you, but then you go beyond what is expected. You listen to the community. You care about this community and you love this community, and I know you all do. You've made my job easy. And Mayor, you've given, and Council, you've given me a lot of compliments, and I thank you for all of them. But I promise you, if I have success here, it's because of people that I get to work with each and every day. I, I, I leave here conflicted, because I love it here. Um, I look forward to the challenges that Akron provides and, and I, I think it's a wonderful community and in, in city. Um, but I leave a part of my heart here. I do. And, um, and I thank you all. Thank you. Well, I think Akron's a very lucky place, but you will always have a home here in Bellevue. So thank you again for, from all of thank us. You. God bless you all. Thank you. Okay, um, Council Member Zahn, we have another proclamation. Could you please read the next one? Yes, Mayor, honored to. Whereas because of the efforts of disability advocates and activists, the Americans with Disability Act, ADA, was signed into law on July 26, 1990 to ensure the civil rights of people with disabilities and establish a clear and comprehensive national mandate for the elimination of discrimination against individuals with 
with disabilities. And whereas the city of Bellevue embraces the diversity, culture, and contributions of many residents with disabilities in our schools, government, workforce, and community, by consistently and diligently working to make city programs, services, and facilities accessible to people with disabilities, and whereas the Diversity Advantage Plan was adopted in 2014 and names guiding principles and recommendations emphasizing the value of individuals with disabilities in our community and the city's commitment to full access and inclusion. And whereas people with disabilities both locally and across the world have experienced disproportionate impacts to their health, social connections and economic stability during the COVID-19 pandemic, and whereas 31 years after the signing of the ADA, individuals with disabilities still experience disproportionate instances of discrimination, poverty, abuse, and health impacts. And whereas the city of Bellevue affirms that while the ADA has significantly changed the lives of people with disabilities, we must continue to strive for equal access and opportunity for this population. And whereas numerous organizations and city staff in Bellevue work with constituents and communities to bring forth the promise of hope and freedom envisioned by the passage of the ADA. Now, therefore, I, on behalf of Lynn Robinson, mayor of the city of Bellevue, Washington, and on behalf of the city council, do hereby proclaim the week of July 25th to July 31st, 2021, as Americans with Disabilities Act week and urge all residents of Bellevue to support disability equity and recognize the value and contributions that people with disabilities add to our city and community. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, is there a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, City Clerk, do we have anybody signed up for oral communications tonight? Yes, thank you, Mayor. This evening, there are six pre-registered speakers for oral communications. And with that, I will call the first speaker, who is Paul Bruno. Mr. Bruno, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. I would like to state that this gentleman, along with the next two speakers, have a PowerPoint to go with their presentation. I will be tracking your three minutes on the side and we'll let you know when you've reached your time. You may begin. Thank you so much. Good evening, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Newenhouse, City Council members, and City Manager Miyaki. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Paul Bruno, and I live in Bellevue and I'm a member of the People for Climate Action, uh, the Bellevue chapter. PCA uh, is our acronym. It's an all volunteer organization and our mission is to support cities like Bellevue that have committed to greenhouse gas or GHG emissions 50% uh, by the year 2030. The three of us that are here speaking this evening uh, wish to commend the council for encouraging city staff to take on more climate action work. We are also here in support of the staff that has been working so hard since the environmental stewardship plan was adopted in December of last year. In addition, after the staff presented their quarterly uh, plan update, we truly appreciated the comments made by council members uh, who wish to see accelerated progress in the advancing of the plan. PCA Bellevue members collectively want to help the city do just that. Some of our members have contributed time to research and compile what climate actions are being taken uh, by other cities uh, across the country. And we thought you might find these uh, comparisons interesting. Uh, Charmaine, if you could go to the next slide, please. To put it in perspective, let's first look at the history of Bellevue's community-wide uh, GHG emissions that's uh, found right on the city website. For the nine years before the pandemic, our community uh, emissions were essentially flat, as you can see in the chart. That was good in the sense that emissions weren't increasing, 
but hasn't resulted in a downward trajectory toward the 2030 target, uh, which is illustrated by uh, the red dotted lines. To show you that such a trajectory is possible, here's a similar chart from Berkeley, California, a city about the same size as Bellevue. Uh, next slide, please, Charmaine. From Berkeley's chart, we see what a city can do. This is showing a 26% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions uh, over an 18 year period. Now, given this is a simplistic slide, uh, the next People for Climate Action speaker you will hear from, Barbara Braun, uh, will provide more detail for not only this slide of Ber Berkeley, uh, but other US cities similar uh, in size to Bellevue. So thank you for allowing me to speak with you this evening, and I wish you all well. Thank you, Mr. Bruno. The next speaker, as Mr. Bruno said, is Barbara Braun. Ms. Braun, can you hear me? Ms. Braun, can you hear me? Oops, sorry. Yes, can you hear me? You're fine. I will track your time separately. You can begin. Um, okay. Uh, so please go to the next slide. Uh, just one, one second here. Um, Good evening, city leaders. Uh, my name is Barbara Braun, and I'm a resident of Bellevue and speaking on behalf of PCA. PCA is so excited that the council consensus is moving forward, taking much bolder action on sustainability. To get an idea of the investment level that might be appropriate for Bellevue, we thought it would be helpful to share information from other cities who are currently making progress much faster than Bellevue. PCA looked at five similar sized cities and looked at what they are spending in 2021 on sustainability as shown on this slide. Uh, the blue is the city level and the green is the um, sustainability level. Budget size varies across these cities from Boulder um, at 341 million to Bellevue at 850 million. On a per capita basis, spending varies from a low of 3254 in Boulder to a high of 6895 per resident in Santa Monica. Bellevue is on the high end at 5739 per resident. City budgets are dependent on the basket of services provided, so this is not an apples to apples comparison or a commentary on Bellevue's efficiency. Each of these cities has a dedicated sustainability department. While these departments invest in a variety of programs, it's helpful to get a big picture view by looking at the size of their budget. Today, Bellevue is spending about $683,000 on the ESI plus one-time grants. By comparison, Boulder and Ann Arbor are spending each uh, over five and a half million dollars. Berkeley is spending less, 1.65 million, but it's making excellent progress on greenhouse gas emissions. Bellevue is spending, um, if you go to actually two slides ahead, but Bellevue is spending 0.08% of its budget on sustainability. If you go back a slide, sorry, they're out of order. Uh, per capita, Bellevue is spending only $4.61 per resident on sustainability, while the comparison cities are spending between $11.49 up to $54.76 per resident. Each of these cities has a sizable sustainability staff ranging from 7 to 18 employees. These include technical staff with expertise in reducing emissions in buildings and transportation. Currently, Bellevue has a staff of two working at the program level and no resident technical experts. By the way, we love what Jennifer and Anna are doing, so um, we just want more. <laughs> Each of these cities has elevated sustainability to, the to, to be central to their city charters and strategies. Their climate action plans are much more robust and integrated across all city departments. A PCA sent council thoughts on how Bellevue might do this via email on June 19th titled Suggested Updates to the City Council Vision and Priorities. Ms. Braun, your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. For Thank you. The final speaker in this group is Court Olson. Mr. Olson, can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Your time or what well, your time will begin now. 
Very good. Hello, Mayor Robertson and uh, council members and uh, city manager Miyaki. My name is Cord Olson and I'm a longtime resident of Bellevue, as you probably know. I'm here to wrap up remarks from the People for Climate Action Bellevue group. And uh, last week we were encouraged by comments that we heard from several of you who wish to see more rapid advances of the environmental stewardship plan. Thanks for making those observations. Uh, tonight, we'll offer recommendations for the future, but first let's look back. Next slide, please. Actually, two down, there you go. Uh, in the six months since the environmental stewardship plan was adopted in December, we've seen a, a rather slow start. Also, several actions scheduled for 2021 have now been delayed to 2022. However, we don't think existing staff is the problem. Both Jennifer Ewing and Anna Huggerup have had ongoing duties for several years. We believe that they've just not had time to rapidly advance the December plan. So we are urging the city to appropriate more funds this fall to hire three more new environmental stewardship staff. As Barbara Braun has just showed you, other cities our size are uh, with robust climate action plans have seven to 18 staff devoted to sustainability work. This is a long haul effort, long haul effort, and full-time staff would bring a long-term vision, develop institutional memory, and make a personal investment to the city's sustainability's work. Next slide, please. Accordingly, Bellevue needs to catch up with other leading cities. Based on our research, we feel that Bellevue's ESI program should have at least a $3 million annual budget and have eight full-time staff. Next slide, please. We recommend another three people doing the roles that are shown in this slide. One of the most important ones we think is an educational outreach effort to convince people what needs to be happening in Bellevue as you start to implement new actions. Next slide, please. This fall, when the current budget is reviewed, we ask that at least $500,000 be carved out to hire three new environmental stewardship staff in the early 2022 year. Next slide, please. Then in the fall of next year, in the fall of 2022, when you're doing a new two-year budget, to boost the ESI staff level up to a number of eight in 2023, we would like you to consider a $3 million annual budget. That would really help the whole program advance as it should. So thank you for listening. Let's do this for them. Next slide, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Olson. The next speaker on the list is Julia Tai. Ms. Tai, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Your time begins now. Thank you. Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Nguyen Hao, and Council Member. As a 13-year Bellevue resident, today I am voicing support for Initiative 21554. I'm sorry, 25-544 work program around impact mitigation for permanent supportive housing. I have participated in CFH's advisory group since January 2020 and currently serve on the CFH Good Neighbor Agreement Advisory Committee. I am proud to represent my neighborhood in both groups. The thoughtful and respectful discussions of the last 18 months have resulted in improvements and adjustments to CFH plan and state operations. I believe the culmination of our collective efforts will advance CFH success at East Gate, benefit their clients, and minimize the impact to the community. However, concerns have been raised about the close proximity of the East Gate permanent supportive housing to CFH and negatively impacting CFH if not operated well. The city should consider setting standards for supportive housing operators, similar to those that shelter operations must abide by. These expectations are not meant to deter permanent supportive housing, but ensure the health and safety of the clients they serve and the community at large. As an example, last November's fatal stabbing of a caseworker at Plymouth 
supportive housing project in Seattle Belltown area serves as a sad reminder on the importance of establishing a safety security plan. After killing the caseworker, the resident left the premises and was out in the greater community for hours before SPD apprehended him. Bellevue's land use code requires homeless services to establish a safety plan. Since both operators are providing services to some of the most vulnerable residents in our community, why must one operator be held to higher standards than another? I recognize the need for permanent supportive housing in Bellevue, but we need to make sure the operators of these publicly funded projects are ready and capable to meet the needs of the clients while minimizing the impact to the nearby community. Please create a set of basic standards for these operators, similar to CFH. Failure to acknowledge this gap may undermine the success of CFH and the permanent supported housing operations and the goodwill built within the community. I urge you to support initiative 21-544. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Ms. Tai. The next speaker on the list is Saki Litov. Mr. Lee Top, can you hear me? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Your time begins now. Awesome, thank you. Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Newenhouse, and other council members. My name is Saki Lito, and I'm a 17-year resident of the Eastgate neighborhood in South Bellevue. I, too, have been involved with the CFH shelter process since 2016 and currently sit with Julia on both the CFH Advisory Council as well as the GNAC group meeting as a requirement of the LUCA for the siting of a shelter related to homeless services. The shelter project has blossomed into a much larger project that includes the building of a 100-bed supportive housing facility that will be operated by Plymouth Housing, as well as a 300-plus unit workforce housing complex, all on the same campus. While I may not agree with how we came to be here, these are all needed services that have the possibility of serving our community well. I say it as the possibility, as I've been expressing concern for the last couple of years, that while the LUCA adds certain requirements for oversight, such as addressing concerns for safety, program standards, security, and most importantly to me, transparency, that are addressed for the shelter, the permanent supportive housing project is treated like a hotel motel in its requirements and has none of the oversight required by a homeless shelter, even though it serves the exact same population. We need look no further than to our neighbor across the lake to see how poorly Seattle has managed its services serving the homeless population of our area. And I've heard many a time that you, as our elected officials, want to ensure these problems do not simply migrate to Bellevue. This is why I was so pleased to see Councilmember Robertson's memo regarding the impact mitigation for permanent supportive housing that is on your agenda this evening and which I sincerely hope you will all support. The lack of mitigation for permanent supportive housing leaves the city of Bellevue and more specifically, the residents of the surrounding areas of Eastgate, Woodridge, Factoria, and more, and more extremely vulnerable to the potential after effects of this oversight. And now with King County's purchase of the Silver Cloud Inn in Redmond slash North Bellevue, there will be many more residents affected. I'm guessing that had you known what the outcome would have been of placing a Chick-fil-A on the corner of 116th and Northeast 8th in the heart of our city, other, considers, other considerations may have been made. Luckily, the major outcome of that glaring oversight is only bad traffic, although I imagine there are more car accidents as well but the potential after effects of an oversight regarding projects serving the most vulnerable of our population can result in what we see happening in Seattle, with people throwing rocks onto the freeway at the I-90 overpass, or the sad death of a caseworker at the hands of a resident of Woman Plymouth Housing Supportive Housing Complex in, in downtown Seattle. I do hope you'll support this recommendation to further review the impact mitigation on any permanent supportive housing projects that happen in our great city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Litov. The next speaker is Karen Morris. Ms. Morris, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great, thank you. Your time begins now. Okay. Karen Morris, address on file. I'm here speaking for Hill Air Neighbors about a long pattern of treatment by three groups, Tent City 4 Sharewheel, Temple B'nai Torah, and at times COB staff. 
This 15 year pattern regrettably is promises made, promises broken. Over that time, we have documented many examples of this and could provide them again if needed. Now I speak to a new example and propose action to demonstrate some mitigation of that pattern and of the fact that this neighborhood has borne the majority impact of these camps here in Bellevue. Before this sixth day of TC4 at TBT, among concerns, I ask if the time limit of the permit would be adhered to. I base this concern on numerous extensions of stay and contraventions of the ordinance in Sammamish right before coming here. In email from TBT, I was told Temple B'nai Torah plans on complying with all code requirements. This includes the length of stay requirement. A COB staff member also verbally stated that the city would be enforcing code requirements, including length of stay. I expressed hope that with their greatly reduced numbers and special funding available for emergency housing at the time, it might be possible for the city to find them housing indoors before end of stay. Shortly before the length of stay was over, TBT sent a letter informing us that they were requesting a 90-day extension. We got no communication or notification from COB, but assumed this has been granted, although we didn't know it was possible. I spoke with COB's homeless outreach coordinator and discovered that the city has done no outreach to this group, but has placed people into the camp. This should change. I also heard her speak about mistrust in the homeless population and needing to do lots of rapport building, mainly by doing what you say you are going to do. I suggest COB et al. need to extend that courtesy to our neighborhood also, where mistrust was built from past experience of numerous promises not kept. This permit was the first extended permit under the new ordinance. It allows two 90-day stays in a three-year period. Normally, there is an 18-month gap between stays. Now, since we have two 90-day stays with no gap, these two should be both allowed stays under that permit, and there should not be another stay or permit at this location for 36 months. That would at least demonstrate some willingness to be fair to this neighborhood and should not be an unreasonable hardship if, as TBT has stated in their letter, a few congregations say they would like to host in the future. Or even better, if some of the spaces at Eastside indoor shelters or the newly purchased hotels for homeless housing surrounding us can be made available to get them inside and better avail them of needed services. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Then that is the end of our pre-registered speaker list for this evening. We do still have a few minutes remaining in oral communications. If there is anyone connected to this call who would like to speak to the council this evening, please use the raise hand function or star nine if you're connected with a phone. I will also mention that we do have a public hearing on the council agenda later this evening on East Main. If you are here to speak about East Main, Mr. Thurston, I see your hand raised. Um, that will be later on the agenda. Are there any additional hands for oral communications? Thank you. Mayor, there are no hands raised. Okay, we're gonna go on with the report of the city manager and then after that, we'll take a short break. Mr. Miyake. I don't hear you yet. I still don't hear you. I think- uh, oh, There I am, can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, a little bit of a technical glitch on my side. I apologize to all. Um, just think, I just wanted to mention under the city manager's report is a management brief <clears throat> as it relates to the um, Bellevue Conflict Resolution Centers uh, eviction uh, resolution program that'll be teed up later this year. It's just meant for um, a written um, management brief and not intended for a presentation this evening. Okay. All right, thank you. So um, if there's any comments or questions on that, please feel free to uh, email uh, city manager or the staff included on that. All right, we're gonna take a quick break. It's almost uh, seven o'clock, so we'll come back at 710. Robertson wants to bring forward and I'm going to give her a chance to describe what she is bringing forward and I'm going to then reference uh, the staff's 
um, report in the council packet that has your first recommendation and then your second recommendation with a bunch of bullets. And we're just gonna look at those individually. And um, so I'll let you go ahead and start, Council Member Robertson. Thank you. And I have a slide um, that I worked with staff to prepare so that we can have them in a really usable manner. So um, as we were have been working with the 1590 money, which we adopted last year, um, and as the legislature's passed new code on supportive housing, and as we've started to make awards um, under the 1590 money or under ARCH awards for supportive housing, and as we adopted an interim official control a few weeks ago, which is set for public hearing next week, I've been thinking a lot about um, about supportive housing. Actually, I'm not ready for the slide right now because um, thank you. I'd like to, to actually talk for a few minutes first and then I'll put it up. Um, so, and I've been thinking a lot about it about how we can make supportive housing work really well for Bellevue. We, when we adopted the 1590 money, we did that because we thought that Bellevue could do a better job at managing that money to provide housing um, and supportive services for the people of this city. And I, I'm going to tell a little bit of a personal story. I don't do it often, but I think I really care about this issue. And my interest in this issue are this, is or is informed by this. I have a brother who is a paranoid schizophrenic who has been homeless since the 80s. He did not have the support he needed. He was offered apartments that were paid for many times, but would not live there. He was on the street without medication, severely mentally ill for decades. It didn't matter what his family, my family did to try to help him because we are not social workers. We are not nurses. We are not psychiatrists or psychologists. And it was only about eight years ago that he, through the help of a social worker, got into a supportive housing type situation. And that supportive housing was an excellent facility that was clean, had outdoor areas. One of the reasons he never wanted to live in an apartment was because he wanted to be outside. It had beautiful outdoor areas. It was clean. It had great programs where he had people that would help him make sure he took his medication and help him with his health issues and support of the other people there. And my brother, I was spent this last weekend at a memorial service for my brother because he died earlier this year. We couldn't celebrate due to COVID. We finally did. Um, but, but he didn't die alone outside, unknown to anyone. He died in a place where he was cared for, where he was had his right mind together, and where he actually could be communicative with other people and the family. He was, and that was the only issue he had was paranoid schizophrenia. Um, he did not have addiction. He did not have aggression, but he needed help. And I look at some of the folks that we are trying to help with supportive housing, and I know that they need support. If there's not support in the supportive housing, it's just housing and we nece won't necessarily help people. It's really, it's just a different geography from the street. It doesn't actually help people get better and deal with their problems. Tonight, we had a disability um, proclamation and we talked about um, disability equity, hope and freedom. To me, a lot of these folks who, not everyone who needs supportive housing has a severe mental illness. Not everyone who needs supportive housing has addiction problems or criminal problems. But many of the people that are hard to house fall into that category and they need help because it's a type of disability. And if we don't provide the help, there's not going to be any movement where they can be under a roof and and in their right mind. So many of the things that are on the work plan proposal are things that will make sure that the people who need these services have the best chance. Because I think Bellevue, I voted to support taking the 1590 money because I really do think Bellevue can do it better. And so most of these items are with regard to the funding. When we are funding these projects, I think we need to do it in such a way as to make the projects really successful. And it's, it's, it's 90% about 
or even 100% about making sure that the people who are living in those projects have the services they need so they can get better and be productive and have and create those relationship ties. There's some of it that's outreach because you want to make sure that when you're having a facility in a neighborhood, the neighbors know what's going on, that they can embrace the project, that they know what to do if there's an issue, and maybe they'll even get involved and help, or if there's something going on that they see, they can intervene and help people, because it's all about helping people. Um, so now I'm ready for the slide, if we can put the slide up. So, and I would and I would point out that that right now the city is in the process of doing RFP work uh, for uh, grant money for the 1590 money. We're in the process of doing the interim official control work for the support of housing land use. So to me, this is exactly the right time. We don't have any pending supportive housing projects in for funding, so this won't delay anything. Uh, and so I think that now while we have a little gap while we're gathering RFP is the time to really look at our standards so that when we start getting applications, whether it's under the land use or under um, grant funding, we have the systems in place to make these projects succeed the Bellevue way, as, we, as it were. So um, on the slide are all of the things that um, we're considering. Um, I had asked about whether we should consider adding some of these things. I didn't say, let's have the council vote and do these things. We need to consider them as part of the work that's being done with regard to the RFP for the 1590 money and looking at the grant agreements. And I think we need to do it as part of the work um, under the interim official control and working towards permanent regulations for supportive housing. So if you look at C, now I would point out there's two C2s because one is already included in the work plan and one is not. Um, the first thing was a preference for Bellevue residents. Um, that is already included in the work plan. The making sure that the inside of a facility is has good maintenance and is habitable for the residents, that is not in the work plan. Um, making sure that the exterior property has standards and maintenance is in the land use code work plan. Um, requirement for certain on-site supportive services. I'm not quite sure exactly what is needed, but I think we need to consider that so that again, the supportive housing actually has some support. Um, and the requirement for a ratio of staff to caregivers to residents, that kind of goes with this determining what supportive services are required. Um, a requirement for a safety and security plan, that's for the residents um, to make sure that everyone stays safe and for the staff and just in general. I, Plymouth did something like this, and that's one of the reasons they're going to be really successful. And then neighborhood outreach and relationship building. Um, and I'm not talking about the type of committee that we have for the shelters. I'm talking about letting people know what's going on, uh, letting people know how they can contact um, the facility, letting them know how they can help and volunteer and be supportive and build, and because it's about building neighborhoods. We talk about building neighborhoods all the time. We want to make sure that this is included in neighborhood building. But I noted some exceptions might be appropriate. For example, if there's a domestic violence shelter, that's one that we don't want people to know where it is. So we wouldn't want to announce where it is and do outreach saying, hey, there's a shelter for um, domestic violence victims. No, we wouldn't want to do that. So these are all things if council um, votes to include these in the work plan, these would just be folded in. Um, it, it would definitely require a little more staff time because it's the eight hour rule. That's why I'm here. But they could be folded in with the work that's ongoing and they could be timely included in the work that's ongoing um, so that we can make sure that these are really, really successful projects. So I will stop talking now. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and I hope that I will have council support because I know that you share the, the desire as I do for us to help the people like that need it and to make sure supportive housing is actually supportive housing because without the support, it's just warehousing. Um, so I hope that you will, you will support my request for uh, this eight hour rule exception and have these things put into the work plan. So the question to, on the table is if we want to support the request to allow staff to extend beyond eight hours to bring back recommendations for the council. And um, I just wanted to clarify something, Councilmember Robertson. 
Mm -hmm. um, we're like at the top, a amount of funds allocated. The fact that it's already included in the work or in the work plan for the funding agreement, does that mean that you also want to see that in the land use code or is that not? No, where these would go or actually they wouldn't go anywhere until council says they would, where they might be in the work plan. Those are things actually, I don't even know if A and B I wrote, I think staff wrote those, um, or maybe I did, but they were how much I'm gonna, maybe I did write them. It's, I've been working on this issue for so many months, but um, it, those are things that they're already doing as part of the 1590 money, as part of the arch money, as part, you know, et cetera. So the question is like C2-1, C3, C4, C5, and C6. Is that correct? Because they are not already being dealt with. Correct. Those are the five items that would be added to the work plan. And I, I think three and four are kind of the same, but. Um, okay. But those are the ones under question tonight. Or they're interrelated. But yes, those are the questions that I am asking for council to support that we do these because we, we want these okay. to be That's successful. That's all right. So, so uh, council, if you look at this graph and you see um, CII-1 and then you see the next one's already included, but the next one after that CIII and then IFI, B and BI, those are the ones that are under discussion tonight. So I'm going to limit the comments and questions to those five that have been proposed. And uh, we can have discussion here, and then we will take each of those and vote on whether we want to advance those or not, because I think it's possible that there may be support for some but not others after our comments and uh, our questions have been answered. So um, is there, go ahead and raise your hand if you have a comments or question. I can see you then I will call on you. I see council member Stokes and I see council member Zahn um, and I see council member Lee. So go ahead, council member Stokes. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you, uh, council member. This is, this is really important and I am glad that this has been brought forward. One of the things, um, well, I think there are two parts to this. One is I wish this had been, and I think we need to reframe it, I, I think the title that's put on this is awful. Mi impact mitigation for what? For these people, because they're, they need mitigating and their activities need mitigating. It's not, it's not consistent with what you talked about with your, with your brother. So I, I would, we've got to change the whole look at this thing. This is not how to keep these bad people away from the rest of the community. And some of the comments today, tonight, and some seen in, in uh, Facebook are, Oh my gosh, we've got to keep these people away. They're freaking out with the uh, silver cloud. Now, it's just a small, small number of people. A lot of people are very supportive. So I'm, I'm really trying to see what is valuable with this. How can we get to the, why do we need this? Or if we do need, need it, let's do it. But we've got to change this because when you look from the outside, it's like one more time Bellevue is trying to make it hard to put people where they need to be taken care of. Uh, I hope that your brother was never looked at as people are looking at the homeless people that we're hoping to put in permanent supportive housing. We've got to change that. Bellevue still has the reputation of being kind of a, oh, we don't want to deal with those people. And we, you know, we sent six years. It just was, you know, pointed out tonight with one of the speakers. They've been working six years to mitigate and to try to keep these people in place. So Now's the time with some good ideas, looking at best practices, what do we need to do without being overbearing, without, without putting this in the, the land use code, putting it in uh, a work plan, putting it in the way we're gonna do this, having best practices and, and come up with something that really works and also is very positive to the community. And it's not being viewed as one way we can just keep those people out of our area. And if you're concerned about safety, you're a lot safer being around these places than you are in your neighborhoods, unfortunately, or walking downtown or being, you know, in the middle of downtown or other places. And it's just, we've got to get our lens away from this, looking at these people as less than people and needing help. 
in a different way. We need to be purposeful, uh, helpful, and like with your brother, be helped in a very loving, helpful, also very, um, you know, uh, caring like a parent in a sense, or like a friend, more like a friend. And not that these are people who are less and we gotta keep them in control. If you can make this and put it in that framework and put this together, I'm willing to look at this and, and move it forward and see what comes out of it. We're not making a decision tonight whether we're gonna do these things. We're gonna, we're making decisions. Should we have some staff take some time to look at this? And I don't think it's gonna take a lot. But if we're looking at best practices and how can when working with developers to make sure that they look at these things, they have a program, not, not a strict, you know, A, B, C, D, you have to check all these things off, but a good program, then I think it's great. But we've got to change our narrative on this and get away from this, stay away um, and embrace. Okay, thank you, Council Member Stokes. Council Member Zahn. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Well, first of all, um, my condolences, Council Member Robertson, on your, on your brother. I can only imagine what that must have been like growing up and, and throughout the years. Um, you know, I, I would say I agree with the premise that we need to focus on what is needed for supportive housing to be the most successful in Bellevue. I think we all want that. Where I think about, though, is um, which conditions are going to be the most conducive for a program to be as successful as possible? And then how do we make sure that our funding actually reflects that? Because otherwise, these are going to seem like unfunded mandates that we don't like. And I know that I was not able to be at the, the meeting last week where we voted on the 1590 money. But And here's where I am have been thinking about, which is the RFPs resulted in $3.3 million worth of ask from the 1590 money. We only funded 1.6. And the Imagine Housing was funding that they requested to for support wraparound services that we said no to because we didn't think that they were doing a good enough job. And my concern is that we need to find a way for success versus finding all the ways why things can't happen. And I think that if we are able to reframe this so that we can look at how to center the providers that are providing the, the supportive housing as effectively as possible and looking at best practices, um, that is a different view than what we're doing here, which seems to be a similar to MFTE where we put rules in place that we thought was the best. And then the community, the developers came back and said, actually, um, these things don't work for us. And we've had to revamp the whole thing in order to uh, create a program that the developers would build affordable housing. And I think we need to be really careful we don't end up in a similar place where we are prescribing things that ultimately are not gonna actually result in the most successful supportive housing. Thank you. So council members on, I'm just gonna say that this is a really good opportunity for us to ask staff questions about the things we wonder. So if you want to try to get an answer, staff, I know they can't answer everything right now, but if you want to phrase any of this in the form of a question of concerns you might have that you wanna get information on, this is a really good time to do that. Okay, well, I would say then for me, all of these pieces of C, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, my question to staff would be the, are these the ones that if we're centering the, the supportive housing providers that they would say are the type of things that actually create the best outcome for both the people that they serve as well as the communities that they've been in? Um, or where did these come from? And my second question would be, what would it take for the for us to look at increasing the 1590 money so that the very things that we are talking about here are going to be incorporated into the resources that they're going to provide and then the third question i have would be is putting these in the land use code the only way that we're going to make sure that we're successful because i'm not sure that the land use code is the right place for all of these 
Thanks. So uh, let's let's continue on with uh, questions and comments, and we'll let staff weigh in. Is that okay, Mac, or did you want to weigh in now? Uh, at your pleasure, Mayor. Happy to take them one council member at a time, or all at the end. Let's let's do it all at the end, if you don't mind. Um, and so we're on to council member Lee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I want to compliment. Uh, Councilmember Robertson for taking the time to come up with uh, a number of ideas. Um, especially, I suppose, you know, in her case of her brother, she's probably very sensitive to this. And, uh, oh, but what I'm looking at is, you know, from a overall bigger picture, I think the key word is we want this to be successful. Uh, I think we all agree you know, we'll be struggling this, working on this, <laughs> we struggled. Uh, for a number of years, and we all decided we're going to have this done. We want it. And uh, however, we want to do it in the right way. And that's why we've been struggling on this. But it's coming together. We're, I'm very, very impressed with what, what we got. And I think uh, a couple of weeks ago, or last week, we showed that. We decided let's vote for it and go ahead and move. Uh, but the one key word is support, support the support of housing. So it's, uh, I agree that it's not just building a facility and people in it, then walk away. It's providing supportive service, the word is support. And to support, and you know, I don't know personally, you know, what it all is gonna make the support, you know, what is it to address the council members question? What are the stakeholders want? What will make this a success program? <laughs> I and mean, we need professionals to answer these questions. We need people who have done it, like Plymouth Housing and other housing and others, uh, and you know, congregation homeless and other professionals. And we want to bring them together to do it. So I'm not sure, you know, even though I appreciate what Councilmember Roberts has done, come up with a list. Uh, I'm not sure if that is the exact list or more or less. But that's the reason why we want the staff to look into it. That's why I'm going to make sure that the city, city council members, uh, you know, bring the questions to the table. And uh, we all appreciate, you know, to do this, it takes money, right? We, it costs, that's why we appreciate 1590 money. They give us another opportunity to make this happen. Without money, we can't do it. We cannot do it successfully. We cannot do it without delay, you know, but do, doing without delay doesn't mean it's not going to be right. We got to do it right. Otherwise, it's not going to work out because it's we, we have to uh, work to satisfy, to meet, like people mentioned repeatedly. It's got to be a successful project. And the Councilman Bajanis mentioned um, it's got to be a successful project, uh, you know, because it needs continuous support. We put some money now, 1590 doesn't last forever. It's not automatic. Eventually, to make it successful, to meet the needs of the stakeholders. Wherever in the future, the city has to continue to provide money and to keep over money when you get have, have communities to support. We have to know what's the best the professionals recommend to come up with. And the community, you know, I hope they're on board. I think they are because we just heard in the uh, earlier uh, uh, communication from the public. Uh, they, 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 you know, we, we are behind this, but you need to we make sure that the stakeholders, the project is successful, so in the future, we can continue to provide the money to support this project to make sure it's successful. As a result, there may be other considerations, and we just have a list here today, and the professionals, we hope the staff will help us. That's all we like to this, we rely on the staff. We have good staff. You know, we can come up with maybe other ideas. Some of these may not work, but I don't claim to be professionals. Oh, I think this works. I think that doesn't work. You know, I may have some opinions on some things. Maybe we can study based on the staff work, based on other best practices, based on the professionals. So, ah, this is works. This includes. And that's the reason we have to, we have to work with, like, you know, Council Member Zan mentioned again, <laughs> the multifamily tax exam. We work with stakeholders. We work with developers. Same thing, we have to work with professionals. We have to work with people, the clients, we have to find out what professionals feel that we uh, have the best program 
best way to do this. Mm -hmm. So maybe other considerations that need to be added. So I'm not going to say, this is the list, this is the final word. No, I don't know that. <laughs> I rely on the staff doing the good work they've done to come up with other professionals, to come up with best we've got. And I agree, we should not delay it. We should not, you know. So I think the timing, comes when Robinson mentioned, it's good. We don't have something right on now. We're going to do it. If we do, we should do whatever we can, but we still need to make sure we provide the opportunity to look at the best we got and what the professionals, uh, stakeholders, you know, other considerations we can include. And we can do something, you know, we can reserve something and we can add them when we need to, and then we can make this a real success. This is, I believe, the way to do it. Otherwise, thank you. it's not going thank to- you, Thank you, Council so, Member Lee. Thank you. Okay, I see Council Member Barksdale, and I see right, uh, Deputy Mayor. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, thank you, Jennifer, uh, sorry, Council Member Robertson for putting this together, uh, taking the time to put this together, and uh, condolences uh, to you and your family for, or for your brothers. Uh, on your loss. I, I do want to say, um, I, I think the biggest challenge for me, I mean, I think Council Member Stokes uh, really spoke to the, the concern in terms of making sure that we're centering uh, the vulnerable population uh, in our community who are experiencing chronic homelessness and need the supportive services. Um, and, and, you know, we're taking a lot of steps to make sure that we provide affordable housing and lower the barriers to providing affordable housing. housing. And I guess for me, this in a way comes across as increasing the barriers. So kind of going in, in contrast to what we're trying to do in other areas. And so I wonder, and uh, I know we've talked about developer flexibility in the past and, and to, to, as a way to lower the barrier. And I feel like we're kind of going in the opposite direction here. And I guess a, a question for staff and I, and I guess sort of a comment really that I think, I think these developers have already shown that they're incentivized to do what's needed. Um, in order for the program to be successful and for um, the residents in their properties to, you know, be well accepted into the community, which is important um, for their success. So I wonder if there's maybe a, a way to do this informally, like through um, sort of putting best practices or guide, you know, um, in, in a pamphlet that they can reference so that it's more of a, they still get the awareness and understanding of like, Here's what we've seen happen in the past and what we think can be successful without really, um, without, so I'm saying more of the carrot instead of the, the stick in this case, I think. Okay, good. I'm just writing this down, isn't it? Um, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of good comments and I appreciate everyone's uh, perspective. And I just kind of want to recenter this conversation just a little bit because I think Let's not get away that I think from the fact that we all want this supportive housing in 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 Bellevue. We might have some different ideas um, uh, about the operations or some of these um, uh, initiatives that uh, Councilmember Robertson put forward today. But let's not forget that I think we're united here as Seven Strong that we want to see this happen, and I think that's the key consideration. And um, I, I did not hear, you know, from Councilman Robertson making anyone less less than. Uh, I heard compassion. I heard about best in class uh, services, supportive services, making sure they're getting the care um, that they need by making sure there's a requirement there that we have the uh, the number of staff in order to do that. And I and I also just hear, you know, centering our our residents as, as well. Um, you know, this is a this is a consideration that we need we need to think about. I mean. Look at look at how many people we heard from this evening, who and I know some of them personally that were skeptical about the Eastgate campus. These folks are on the GNAC now. These folks are trying to make this the most successful possible solution for Bellevue. I think that's a win. These are the same people that had expertise in this area, and we should take advantage of that and we should listen to that. I, I almost think this is tantamount to what we heard from the uh, people for uh, climate action. We have experts in our community. We need to listen to them. We need to embrace them. We should make them a part of this conversation. And um, I, I think all we're, we're looking at tonight is allowing staff to do some research on our behalf 
And I absolutely agree with the comment about reaching out to providers and operators, getting their perspective on this, because the last thing I think any of us want to do is to slow this down nor do we want to hurt anyone that needs to get into permanent supportive housing now. And I do not want uh, Plymouth to back out of, you know, establishing, um, you know, supportive housing in, in, in Bellevue. I want them to be successful. We all want them to be successful. So my, my perspective is let staff do the work. Um, let's, let's get some of that analysis done. Let's see where we're at. I think let's make sure we, we, we take in consideration all the um, good information that we can get from uh, these, uh, these different agencies and providers and, and then as well as our residents. Uh, I think that's a, that's a component of, of, of that as well in, in terms of what we've heard tonight. So I look forward to that conversation. I look forward to what Mac and his, and his great team come back with and uh, some of their recommendations and what their analysis shows. And I think we take it from there. So uh, Councilman Robertson, really appreciate you bringing this forward. Um, uh, as, as everyone's expressed in you know, our sincerest condolences for, uh, for your brother, can only imagine how difficult of a situation that was, but uh, appreciate you bringing this forward for the, for the conversation that we're having this evening. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm going to give my thoughts on this and then try to summarize what I've heard. Um, I, you know, in, in listening to everybody, um, there's a lot of use of the word success. And I'll tell you, as somebody, as a physical therapist who's worked with many different abled people, success has its own definition for every individual. I used to volunteer my physical therapy skills at the Pike Place Markets Homeless Medical uh, Clinic. What, um, and so I've you know, I've spent time with many individuals who have struggled and I've seen just some of the impossibilities of their situations. And I know for a fact, you cannot improve your situation if you do not have stable housing. So as Deputy Mayor said, I think we're all on board with that. And um, so tonight we're talking about, you know, how do, how do we best do that? How do we serve the residents? of the supportive housing while serving our entire community. And um, I do question if this is equitable or if it uh, creates new barriers. So I'd like staff to kind of look into that a little bit. I wonder if it will slow down the creation of other permanent supportive housing development. Uh, when I think of the people that these types of housing serve, I think about my friends who have adult children with disabilities that, who will never be able to live independently. And they're either going to live with their parents for the rest of their lives, or they're going to have a situation where they can live in, in a, a unit that has support for them. And we just don't have that in Bellevue right now. So it's not just about homeless individuals. It's about people who are unable to live independently. And, and so I'm very interested in creating more opportunities. Um, so and so my question is, you know, do we have the staff and or the budget to um, look into these questions and to look into this request of Councilmember Robertson? Um, and I'm wondering what staff recommends or if we should have stakeholders involved as well to create best practices on this. So. This is where I personally would like staff to weigh in tonight. And um, Council Member Robertson, unless you have something else you want to say, I'm going to hand it over to staff. Uh, well, can we, do you want to, okay, go ahead, Council Member Stokes. I'll give everybody, I guess, a chance to speak again. Okay, I, I was just going to say, I didn't even notice the title on the memo. Um, I didn't write that title on the memo. And you're right, it does send the wrong message and is not at all a capture of what um, I intended to achieve here. So, and I would point out that most of these things are not land use code things. Most of these things are carrots that would be put into a funding agreement. And if they cost more money and Bellevue wants them, then Bellevue is going to need to help fund them. And that would be my expectation is that if we're going to require a certain amount of support, it, primarily this would be an operations agreement. Some of it might be in a capital improvement agreement as far as the how, how you know, if we're 
funding the capital and how it lays out, but mainly it would be in the operations. That's so how I, I see it too. That's how I see it. And I would also add, I, I uh, Mayor, I didn't say it, but I agree. It's uh, kids who um, or adult children who can't live apart often can be in this kind of situation. In that case, the safety and security plan would be if people are in wheelchairs, how are they going to get them out in a fire? Um, how are they going to make sure the residents don't, you know, are, are safe with each other, safe from the general public, um, et cetera? It's not just about othering. It's about uh, inclusivity and making sure that the folks who are in these are cared for with love, intention, and adequate, not just adequate, but excellent levels of services, because that's what everyone deserves. So I'll just leave it there. I, I, I like the idea of having staff just come back and present it to us. Best practices is kind of what I was trying to get to. I didn't coin it though, Council Member Stokes did, so thank you for that. Um, that is really where I am, so thanks. Okay. Uh, Mayor? No, Council Member Stokes raised his hand next and I'm gonna go around and give everybody an equal chance to speak again. Go ahead, Council Member Stokes. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, just a couple of things, and I really appreciate uh, uh, Council Member Robertson, what you're saying on this. And I think that, um, and, and I think this is what I was aiming at. Let's let's get this on a lens of moving forward and doing this in a positive way because we really care for these people and we want to do the best. And this is part, it's not get away from the, uh, well, you know, we got to control these people or make sure they don't do bad things. Let's work on how do we go forward on it. And I think we'll, we'll have great success. I'd like, if we can turn this around in, in, in people's minds that this is something that we really, have to do, and we can do it well because we're Bellevue. Um, and I think that's where we're, we're uh, going. So I, I really appreciate that. The second is um, on the timing. Um, I mean, I guess the sooner the better. It's just um, I just want to know, you know, can staff can work this in? I don't, I don't see it as really a huge problem, and I wouldn't want to get it into a citizen advisory committee and go back and forth. And next thing you know, it's three years past, and we're still working on it. I think this is something staff can come up with, best practices, standards, talk to us about it, and then we can we can get something in shape that's not, you know, put in stone, but is is a good um, step forward. So I'm 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 feeling very good about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Council Member Zahn. Uh, yes, Mayor. Um, I was hoping that staff was going to answer the three questions that I had in the first round. In addition to that, um, as I've listened to my colleagues. Uh, what I've also thought about is that it is about do these pieces that we absolutely all agree are important elements, these and many others, to the success, where does it actually go? Because one of the things we also want to make sure we don't end up in is that by putting these into land use or funding agreements, that we're actually going to slow everything down versus having it um, at the right time, because we've certainly seen with, with actually CFH that we've actually had to put in more money for funding because adding these pieces in have actually um, lengthened their time. The work would have been done anyway, but the timing actually created issues that cost a lot of money and time. So I believe uh, that I had three questions that was in the first round is, is now the time that I'm gonna get a response. Well, I'm giving everybody a chance and there's more than two rounds. Everybody can go around as many times as we need to, but I was hoping actually to go right to staff, but since council member Stokes wanted to weigh in, I felt only right that we give everybody a chance to at this moment. So- okay. um, I don't know if I have more questions because I don't have the answer to the first round. So. All right, well, you'll get you, you'll get a chance after we hear from staff. Does is anybody else feel a need to talk or can we move on to staff? Okay, Council Member Lee, I'm gonna give you a very tight window here. Go ahead. Well, if you say less, I would uh, then take less time. <laughs> I have been thinking about this for a while, you know, and as def definitely, I think that's exactly what the council wants. You know, we talk about that. We wanna move this forward. There's no question about it. Uh, the one thing I just want to add, you know, is the list that's included. I think I made the point. There may be other things, other lists that can help the success of this project. <laughs> we know experts just because it's listed here. Jennifer happened to put it there, and we may or may not disagree with it. 
but the staff is the expert we depend on and we trust them. So I really like to have the staff have an open mind, look at it. And if we need resources, we want it to happen. We have to consider if we got to put money where mouth is. I thank think, you. thank you, Council Member Lee. And I think I heard that with uh, requests of staff and stakeholders to create best practices. Anybody else want to weigh in? Council Member uh, Barksdale. Just, just really quick, uh, two questions. One, um, curious about the implications on cost and schedule of an operations agreement or um, so I think council member Zahn brought that up too, but just wanted to be a clarification on that. And then the second one on the best practices, uh, what are the alternatives and what um, would having uh, sort of an informal sort of pamphlet, when I say best practices, I mean like not codified, but like here's some information about what might work, uh, how staff sees that as an, as an alternative or an option. Okay, Thank great. You. Uh, Deputy Mayor, did you have any other comments, questions? Not this time, Mayor. I'll wait till uh, after staff. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Mac, hope you uh, took notes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, Mayor, I was feverishly writing down. Um, hopefully, I, uh, I got everybody's questions. If I missed one, please absolutely just let me know. Um, there are, the questions kind of fall down into a couple of categories, kind of questions about um, some of the individual items and, and what they are and how they'd be built into an analysis phase and, um, and building that into a work plan. And then some of them get into like just, just now here implications on uh, schedule and best practices and that sort of thing. So I'll try to hit them in that order, not necessarily just in terms of, uh, you know, who asked two questions and three questions and one question and so forth. So the first couple questions that were brought up relate to um, how the, the things you see on that spreadsheet came to be and whether or not that lit, uh, list is an exhaustive list around best practices. Excuse um, me, Matt, end, do you oh, want yeah. to put that, back, that slide back up so we can look at it while you talk? Sure, that, that, be helpful? that, that might be helpful um, just for a few moments. Um, this list was generated by Council Member Robertson um, we did not uh, do a separate staff analysis to see if there may be other best practices to add to the list for council consideration. Um, in the amount of time we had and worked with council member Robertson, we were trying to help her understand what's already in the work plan um, so that if, if the council wanted to, we could add these items. So as a separate additional item, if you'd like us to look into were there other best practices that some of the permanent supportive housing providers may recommend the council take a look at, we could certainly add that as a, an additional kind of catch-all to the work plan. Um, and so as a result, um, there was another question there about, well, uh, you know, is the land use code the place? I think council member Robertson touched on this in her comments. Part of the analysis uh, that staff would do and bring back to you is actually whether or not the land use code is the appropriate place at all for some or any of these things. It could be appropriate for some, it could be appropriate for none. Um, there's a lot of analysis that would actually go into that, whether or not they should all exist uh, in the funding agreements themselves and what a standard set of conditions uh, around operating may look like. So one of the goals I think I, I've heard also expressed is uh, a desire to see how uh, any such set of regulations would impact the ability to deliver and cite permanent supportive housing in the city we would certainly be looking at that as part of the analysis to bring back to you all about um, standard sets of conditions versus project specific conditions and how that affects timing, um, cost and the ability to um, deliver these actual projects. Then there was a question um, and it was sort of reiterated in slightly different terms around, can this be done informally? Uh, and certainly in any scenario we can work on if it's a desire of the council information um, and we do that frequently about different uh, different things that, that occur in the community. Um, and, and we're happy to do so and work with our housing staff about what that might look like. Uh, I think the question before the council tonight is, would you like us to do uh, evaluation and analysis of uh, these things and anything else you may wanna add to the list for potential implementation as a more formal set of approval conditions as compared to an informal set of information for would-be operators of permanent supportive housing. So the answer to that question is yes, it could be done informally. I think the council is having a discussion about, uh, do you wanna think about something more formal? Uh, questions came up around um, how equitable or does this add new barriers? 
uh, we would certainly want to do that analysis and bring it back for you and talk about uh, should these types of conditions be put in funding agreements or be made a portion of land use code, um, whether or not that would in fact add new barriers and how um, it would relate to actually siting and getting permanent supportive housing built in the city. So we would bring that back to you. And then uh, probably the there was a couple of questions generally around, do we have staff and budget uh, and what this all looks like? And the answer is we do have housing staff and we do have city planners and we do a, a bunch of things around these various topical areas. This isn't built into the work plan uh, at the current time, which is why we're kind of bringing this to you as an eight hour rule exception. We probably would need to get back to you on the length of time and, and the staff impact. If council wanted to move forward, it would definitely have an impact. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say a significant impact, but definitely not insignificant. Uh, and I'm not trying to be cagey in that answer other than there's a lot of uh, staff time between the development services group, the planning group, and a certain amount of legal analysis that will need to go into creating the recommendations for you all around pros and cons of each of these things uh, and the vehicle, meaning where, if you wanted to implement such a concept would be the best place to do it. So what we would do, um, there would be an opportunity cost. We would likely pull some, some housing folks uh, or delay a few projects so that we could uh, get to work on this or fit it in where it could, but it, but it certainly would be, would be additive. The question around recommendations, if council wanted us to study this, we would absolutely bring back recommendations on each of the items individually and in some so that you could see how it fit into the overall uh, way that we're looking at the continuum of care model in the community and how we can best provide service for all parts of the community. What, part of which is a business question around how to help um, get these facilities built um, as well as, as operating well. So talking about barriers to entry you know, and so forth. So where do we go from here? Um, that's ultimately a question for the council and we're happy to help in any way we can if you wanna move forward. And I think I got everybody's questions. I think we'll, we'll stop there. Well, I will say that in summarizing what you just said, there's a fork in the road where we look at, do we ask you to analyze these recommendations as put forth by council member Robertson? Or do we ask you to have an open mind and look at this and also anything else that would be a recommended best practice, either by staff or stakeholders. So that's one fork. The second fork would be, do would we recommend that it be a recommended best practice or is it codified? And if we codify it, where, where would we do that? And so those to me are kind of uh, two key questions in terms of what our recommendation will be for you tonight. I feel like we can vote on the first one. I'm not sure if we're ready to vote on the second one, but um, can I just get comment on uh, my proposal for staff, if we're going to ask them to look at anything, that we look at the recommendation as well as any other recommended best practices by uh, staff or stakeholders. So council member Robertson, I'll let you start. Thank you. No, I, I, I like this conversation we're having because these were just ones I came up with trying to come up with some best practices. So I would be in favor of having them look at these as well as other best practices. And I agree with you, Mayor, that I don't think we're ready to decide, I, I certainly am not, whether these would be recommendations, whether they would be funding agreements, whether they would be code. Um, I think we won't know that until we know what the best practices are and what and whether those are going to create um, any challenges to getting these projects off the ground. So I need I need staff's analysis. I think everyone else does whether to so we can decide how to best implement these. But let's first figure out what the best practices are and then we'll figure out how to implement them. So let's say that that is what is going to be on the table tonight is if we want to advance staff's analysis of the recommendations and any additions um, to bring back or not. <laughs> or, you know, um, if you have a modification, but I, I think, you know, from what I've heard from everybody, this seems to be the pivot point here. So um, if, if there's a motion, uh, I think Council Member Zahn, you have a question or a comment? You know, I, I do have a, 
comment slash question. So we have a lot of items on our work plan. And I guess what I'm really trying to understand is if we vote to add this, where does that, where is that going to fall? Because we're also talking about East Main and the potential of going higher with height for affordable housing. Um, when we were at the retreat, we also talked about staff looking at consideration of a safe parking program. So I want to make sure that as well as moving with Wilburton and, and Bell Red. So I just want to understand if we vote yes to include this, where, what's actually going to get pushed to be later in the priority or how that's going to work? Because we do have a lot of things that we want staff to work on. And certainly affordable housing is a huge part of that, as well as the, the the strategies we already have to address homelessness. That's a consideration, Councilmember Stokes. Well, I guess one question is, uh, or I, I, my understanding of the landscape is that this is not something we would rush to apply in the next three months or even probably, <laughs> hopefully we'll have more coming in, but we've already, we're not, this is not dealing with Plymouth. Plymouth, we got that set up and everything's going. This is for the future. Um, and I think we want it done well. We don't want it rushed because there's no rush. At the same time, uh, we do have a lot of other things that are going forward too. And we all, you know, we keep talking about we want Bell Red to go, we want Wolverton to go, we want this to go. Uh, we're putting more on staff, but, um, and I think if we need to find some additional funding for that, we should do that. But I don't, I, let's don't put a real tight timeline on this, but make a commitment uh, that's, that staff can handle. Um, and it may take a lot less time than, than we think in a sense to come up with this. Uh, there's probably somebody around this country who actually has something like this. So I think, and I think we need to give staff the option to, and, and, and Mac the option to look at this and how do we fit this in with everything else because uh, we need this done well, but it's not something we need tomorrow. It's, so it's, based on what I'm hearing, Mac, do you think it would be possible under eight hours to come back with uh, a, uh, what it would take for you to give best practice recommendations to us and have the discussion about where they fall, uh, whether it's a budgetary or an operational or a land use thing? Do you think you could kind of map out what it would, the impact would be if we voted for that? Could you do that un before underneath an eight hour rule? So I think there's maybe two, two components to that question, Mayor. Um, just on the first part, coming back with recommendations on kind of where these things would fit, I'm certain we could not do that. In fact, I'm certain it'd be much more than eight hours. The right. question I think everybody's asking maybe a little more philosophically is, okay, if we take this up, what else is going to be delayed or, uh, you know, or how does this all work with the overall work plan? What That's, is the scope of the work and how does it impact the work, the existing work plan? That's right. And uh, I, I don't have a firm answer on that. There, there would be a, uh, a number of departments that would be impacted. Um, the likely impact would be to one of the other housing programs or one of the planning initiatives, um, which is usually in the form of a delay in the case of analysis as compared to you know, something more drastic. Um, certainly not something on the scale of East Main, but we would need to pull one of the project managers uh, and have them focus in on this um, in order to accomplish the types of things that the council is looking at wanting information on here. Could you come back to us next week and tell us where this would fall in the queue that we have already if we were to move forward with this based on, you know, Council Member Stokes thoughts that maybe we're not in a huge hurry to supplant other goals, but if it's something we want to work on in the future, where would that fit in the queue? Could you bring that back to us? Uh, yeah, I'm going to say qualified. Yes. I believe that, uh, you know, we can sit down as staff in the next week and get a, now that we have a better sense of potentially the scope that council will want to look at and see what the overall timing impacts could be, um, mm -hmm. and then have, have something for you. Cause that's something I feel more confident voting on 
than tonight just kind of guessing what the impact would be to our existing workload that we've prioritized. Not to say that this, that this isn't important, but it's hard to supplant blindly. So um, what do you think about putting off the vote tonight to next week when we get a little more information on where this would fit in our work plan? Council Member Robertson, do you feel comfortable with that? Um, well, I'd love to have council initiate the work with the schedule and um, impacts to come back next week so that we can adjust how fast it's gonna be done. Because I think I think at the time is kind of now to do it because the interim official control and supportive housing is, is going and we're about to hit RFPs for um, these types of projects. But um, so, I mean, obviously it's a council decision. We can vote next week. Um, but I think if we gave direction that we want to do it and then they come back and we can then say, we, we don't want to do it or we want to scale it down or we want to slow it down, that might be a little bit more uh, clarity for staff. Well, tell you what, you can make that motion and see how it goes. And if you succeed, fine. If you don't, we'll make another motion. Okay. Well, I, I move to direct staff to consider the supportive housing considerations to do the analysis um, on that, but to come back and do a check-in with council next week on the, on a high overview of the scope and timing considerations so that council can give further directions on how this will be processed. Second. Any comments or questions? It's six and one, half a dozen of the other. Okay. Mayor. Yes, council members on. I just want to make, make sure we're really clear about what we're voting on. So we're voting on having staff um, do this work, but they're going to come back next week with the timing implication instead of what you recommended, which is wait until next week when we understand what would get displaced. Is that right? I just want to make sure I'm clear about what we're voting on right now. Yeah, I think that's pretty much sums it up. And I'll tell you, I, I'm more comfortable with having staff come back next week, to be honest with you. It's not that I don't support this work, this recommendation, but I want to know exactly what I'm voting for and the impact it has on our work plan. So uh, since it's well, a new initiative. So in, in deference to you, Mayor, then I, I'm going to withdraw my motion. I just hate to spend too much time next week on it other than to get a report from staff. Right. And why don't we bring it back next week with staff um, providing a high flyover and and maybe staff can craft a motion because I did that completely on the fly um, and <laughs> on, on initiating the work plan, including best practices, so. Okay, can we get a head nod for that or we can do a vote if we need to, but I think you have no, a consensus just head for that. Nod. Just and, uh, yeah. uh, Council Member Lee, I can't see your head moving. Are you yeah. nodding? Okay. It's the same. All right. Okay. Very good. All right. Thank you, Council Member Robertson. Appreciate the, the discussion. Okay. Uh, we are on, I believe we're on to the consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? I move to approve the consent calendar. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes. So now we have a public hearing. Uh, Mr. Miyake, could you please introduce that? Yes, thank you, um, Mayor and Council Members. <clears throat> As you mentioned, the matter in front of you uh, this evening is the public hearing on the Land Use Code Amendment for the East Main Station area. And just by way of background, <clears throat> I had a study session on June 28th. Council was introduced uh, to the proposed Land Use Code Amendment to create the land use code for the East Main Station area. area, And at that meeting, the council director staff to prepare and schedule the land use code amendment for public hearing and identify topics that council would like additional information on at a future study, at future study session. So following the public hearing, um, uh, council will have the opportunity to identify any additional topics they'd like to discuss at future study sessions. Um, joining us this evening um, for a brief staff report uh, are Mike Brennan, the director, Tristan Tannis, consulting attorney, Nick Whipple, senior planner, all from the Development Services Department. Mike?
Mike, are you there? Yes. Uh, there you go. Excuse me. Um, let me get my video going here. Uh, apologize for the technical glitch. There we go. So good evening, um, uh, Deputy or Mayor uh, Robinson, Deputy Mayor Newenhouse, and Council members. Um, we are here, as Mr. Miyaki uh, said, uh, for the public hearing for the East Main Land Use Code Amendment. Um, that draft was published. Um, earlier this year, and um, we have already um, had a number of conversations with stakeholders and a study session uh, with the council in uh, June. Um, tonight, we are looking for um, the council to initiate the public hearing, and then following the public hearing, uh, any additional direction that the council would like to provide staff on the content for the future study sessions, as council will recall in the meeting on June uh, 28th, you did provide us a direction on some of the topic areas um, based on some of the stakeholder feedback that you would like to discuss further. Uh, and we will be preparing that information uh, when we return to council for study sessions starting in September uh, following the council break. Next slide, please. So the agenda for this evening, um, the agenda, uh, next slide, please. The agenda for this evening would be just a brief context setting for the East Main and how it fits into some of the um, more comprehensive planning initiatives that have been going on over the last number of years related to the light rail project in the city. Um, a bit about the, the land use code timeline, uh, kind of where we've been, where we are, and then the next steps. Uh, an overview of the land use code amendment topics. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, just an overview of the public engagement. So next slide, please. So this slide um, really provides really a broader context for how the land use code or the East Main fits into really the, the good work that the city has been doing for over a decade, really leveraging the investment that's been made for the East Link light rail system. As council will remember uh, back in 2013, the, the decision on the alignment for the, uh, the light rail or the East Link project um, was decided by the council and the Sound Transit Board. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a very important decision that really just defined where within the city light rail services would be provided and the specific locations of the stations um, that would um, provide access to the community. In 2015, the Spring District began construction uh, around the light rail station, uh, the Spring District uh, 120th Street Station really an important uh, step implementing the Bell Red plan, which was really a, a uh, replanning of the entire Bell Red corridor uh, in alignment with the discussions that were going on in defining the light rail alignment. Uh, following uh, the beginning of that construction, which was really a first uh, move toward the construction of transit oriented development around light rail stations, the East Main CAC was launched in 2016 and really did some great work defining the future um, recommendations for the transformation of the properties around the East Main Station uh, on Main and 112th Avenue. Uh, also, shortly following the initiation of that CAC, the Downtown Livability Land Use Code was adopted and Council uh, will recall a, a very um, robust conversation and really a refresh, a major refresh of the city's downtown code um, for the first time in, in, in several decades. Um, and that uh, allowed for really reshaping the, um, the profile, I think, of the downtown horizon uh, or skyline with uh, towers now up to 600 feet, adding additional incentives to create more public and open space uh, and um, really rethinking some of the, the uses and uh, pedestrian orientation at grade in the downtown area. And we are now seeing projects that are well under construction, taking advantage of those changes that were made um, in that code update uh, for downtown livability. In late 2019, um, East Main CPA was adopted, amendments to the comprehensive plan that really um, carried forward the work of the CAC and the continued deliberations of the council for shaping this part of the city, the East Main uh, planning area. That CA, the CPA update really um, defined the, the future vision for the East Main area. Following the 2019 adoption of the CPA, we began work on the land use code amendment and in late 2020 published the complete draft of land use code for East Main. Uh, that 
document. That draft has been advancing forward in discussions both with stakeholders in the community over the last number of months, including uh, a couple of study sessions with the council where you provided staff some additional direction on the content of that code. Um, we are here this evening to take the important next step, and that is really to hear from the community on their interests, um, their suggestions, uh, their preferences for the East Main area in response to what has been proposed in the land use code uh, draft. Uh, and then following that, as I mentioned, we'll be returning back to council with additional study sessions on the topic areas the council would like to discuss further um, before you make your final decision on uh, the final code. So at this point, I'll hand it over to Tris Nakanis, who will speak a little bit about the uh, kind of the, the schedule and the next steps uh, for the uh, land use code amendment process. Trisna. Thanks, Mike. Uh, next slide, please, Charmaine. Um, good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council. Um, following up on Mike's description of the broader context, um, the city context and timeline, this slide focuses on the East Main Luca timeline. So prior to tonight, we started in earnest um, in Council's um, for Council's direction and Council's processing of this LUCA last year. Um, following briefings in May, we've had two study sessions. And at that uh, point in July, Council directed staff to finish drafting the code, including the economic analysis that would inform the draft code. So we had, uh, that was completed. Uh, the economic analysis was done at the end of fall and then the draft code completed towards the end of December. So throughout the work in preparing the economic analysis, as well as the complete draft code, as Mike mentioned, we have been working with our stakeholders. Um, and after the, the drafts were produced, uh, we did share that with our stakeholders also. And we continued working with our stakeholders um, throughout the beginning of this year. And on June 28th, as you know, we presented this, this draft code to council. And council also saw a list of requests from stakeholders in that study session. Um, we have received direction from council to prepare and schedule this public hearing, and that's where we are tonight. Um, and we, um, we are noting that the adoption of the LUCA will be at council's discretion, of course, and can happen at any time after tonight's public hearing with that or with one or more study sessions in the future. Um, it is also council's decision uh, as to what changes to the draft code council wants to ultimately direct uh, to staff and staff does plan to bring forward any implication um, to time and process so that council has that information when it makes um, when they make that direction to us. So next slide please. Um, giving a quick recap now to the role of the various documents in the process, the progression of this process is from a high level in the comprehensive plan down to the specific design details in development application and review. The first uh, process item is the comprehensive plan. It sets the vision and policy priorities. These priorities are high level and broad. And at the same time, the comprehensive plan is intentionally flexible so that there is room for the land use code to maneuver and be responsive to that um, to the high level priorities. And that's the, the second um, item is the land use code and that's where we are uh, tonight and um, throughout this process. Uh, the land use code includes requirements, standards and design guidelines that will govern the review and approval of any development application within the East Main area. And um, the third and last process item is that development review. And in that development review, um, we get to look at the more specific information and elements, um, includes the specific design that a developer is proposing. And it's important to remember that the developer is the one who chooses what they wanna build on their property. So their design of that development and when they wanna submit their application and ultimately build on their site. The city or development services would certainly review this development application for compliance with the code. And um, just again, noting that we are here now in the, uh, the process of drafting the land use code that will apply to East Main. And um, this are the standards, uh, requirements and design guidelines. Next slide, please. Um, just a, a quick recap on the, uh, the vision that was part of the uh, comprehensive plan amendment for East Main. 
And the vision is that in 2035, East Main is a vibrant, livable, and memorable transit-oriented development neighborhood where there are housing choices, um, offices, hotels, and other commercial uses uh, that it would sit comfortably between downtown and a low density single family neighborhood to the west of 112. Um, having small walkable blocks and connected pathways so people can move easily between the light rail station and places in and around the station area. Um, as noted earlier, this vision is what council adopted through the Comprehensive Plan Amendment for East Main in 2019. Next slide, please. With that, I'm now going to turn the presentation to Nick to provide more detail on the draft code and the requests that have been submitted, as well as the ongoing public engagement. Nick. Thank you, Trisna, and uh, good evening, Mayor Robinson and members of the council. So as Trisna noted, I'll begin um, talking about just the various land use components um, that are included, or the land use code components that are included with this LUCA. Um, staff has broken these components up into three topic areas. So we'll be discussing urban form, housing, and then just touching briefly on code structure. Um, so the draft land use code includes provisions that allow the uh, new transit oriented neighborhood to complement downtown and the single family neighborhood uh, with consideration of lower building heights along 112th Avenue Southeast and taller buildings along the uh, interstate 405 and the border of downtown. Uh, the maximum building height uh, that's proposed in the LUCA is 250 feet, which is about 23 stories. Um, this is the same maximum how, or excuse me, this is the same maximum height that's allowed uh, north of Main Street in the downtown OB South land use district. The heights would uh, decrease to a maximum of 70 feet, which is about six stories, um, when located within 50 feet of 112th Avenue um, to provide that transition to the Surrey Downs neighborhood to the west. Um, the height transition is the same policy approach taken citywide um, as denser areas of the city abut land use districts that are um, of a lower density. And some examples, uh, we've got the photo on the right here um, uh, that's called the Surrey on Main project. Um, that's a project that was developed or is under construction right now on Main Street and 108th Avenue Northeast. It does abut the down, or it's in the downtown, it abuts um, the Surrey Downs neighborhood. So we see a lower height there uh, to transition uh, to the Surrey Downs neighborhood to the south. And then the second photo um, is a past project application for the Sheraton site. That's the property just north of Main Street um, under the uh, downtown OLB zoning. And then for maximum density or FAR, um, the density would be a five FAR under the draft land use code, which is the same as the downtown OLB South District in the north. Uh, the LUCA also provides for walkable blocks. Um, it, it implements a, a 1300 foot perimeter block length requirement. Um, the same block length requirements apply in Bell Red, another area in the city where um, new walkable blocks have been created. Uh, it does provide, the land use code draft does provide for exceptions along 114th Avenue Southeast and near Sturdivant Creek where smaller blocks are infeasible. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, the blocks, they can be framed by open space, they can be framed by potential streets, um, which are similar to some of the mid-block connections in downtown or bike connections um, or a, a vehicular street. So those are the options um, to create those walkable blocks. Um, the vision does call for small walkable blocks and connected pathways in the station area with an emphasis on pedestrian comfort. Uh, and then uh, for the next topic, the larger floor plates. So the maximum floor plate size that's recommended in the code um, is the same that can be built in the downtown OB South land use district north of Main Street. Uh, the, the floor plate sizes in downtown OB South are the largest floor plates that are allowed uh, in downtown and they are larger than uh, the floor plates that are also allowed in Bell Red, um, just to provide that increased flexibility uh, for developers. Next slide, please. So for multimodal connectivity, the LUCA uh, does provide for one east-west pedestrian bike connection through East Main. Um, this connection would land somewhere between the uh, Main Street slip ramp, uh, which is the area just south of the Main Street bridge, uh, that would be the north extent and then the uh, other area where we've got ex uh, proposed uh, through connection is uh, just north of the Bellevue Athletic Club at our pre-located street. So this pedestrian bike connection is an additional connection that would land somewhere between those two points. Um, you could think of it as maybe somewhere between the Hilton Hotel and the Red Lion Hotel. 
Uh, and one required pre-located street is also um, included with the East Main Land Use Code Amendment. The pre-located street is north of the Bellevue Athletic Club and uh, it's right between the Hilton and the Bellevue Club. And the pre-located street is designed for vehicular traffic, but this low volume street would also provide access to cyclists. The LUCA includes uh, elements for uh, the, that really emphasize the, emphasize the pedestrian experience. So uh, elements such as ground floor uses, seating, weather protection, artistic elements, um, all ensure an enriched uh, experience for the pedestrian on the ground plane. Uh, the provisions related to pedestrian emphasis are very similar to the requirements expected of downtown development um, with flexibility that's been added in this land use code amendment, um, in particular for the type of ground floor uses that could be cited within the TOD. And uh, there are eight amenity options in our amenity program uh, in the draft land use code amendment. The program is set up to prioritize affordable housing uh, for any project that's a residential project. And then child care service uses, open space, and potential streets uh, for our non-residential development. Uh, so the emphasis here is to advance the affordable housing strategy and prioritize the public benefits that are most needed for this area. Next slide, please. And for the next topic area of housing, um, this loop is designed to promote housing development. Um, the LUCA includes a higher uh, floor area ratio or base floor area ratio rather uh, for residential development compared to office development to help encourage more housing development. Um, the LUCA also includes reduced minimum parking for residential uses, unlimited floor plate sizes for buildings that are less than 80 feet. Um, and we've expanded the uses that can occur on the ground level in a residential building um, to include residential units and residential amenity spaces uh, to increase that, that uh, flexible option for developers building housing. Uh, the LUCA also has a requirement in the draft for a minimum 30% of the total project gross square feet to be residential use. And uh, the LUCA prioritizes affordable housing through the incentive program. So uh, where additional height and floor area um, is offered in exchange for affordable housing at an 80% AMI, the LUCA requires uh, that the affordable housing be built on site, so on site performance for those areas. Um, so that the, the affordable housing is built in that transit rich uh, East Main TOD. And then lastly, uh, for the code structure, the LUCA was developed to be consistent with the citywide code framework and process, including permit review processes, uh, how the public is made aware of a future development in the TOD, uh, et cetera. Next slide, please. So there are a number of uh, topics that Council is interested in discussing further uh, per the June 28th study session. Uh, the topics relate to the list of requested items provided the, by the uh, property owner stakeholders within the TOD. So we do plan to bring back these topics uh, beginning in September for Council discussion. Uh, some of those topics include building heights, uh, step backs, block size exceptions, uh, the minimum housing requirements, AMI levels for units based on tenancy, um, a fee and lieu model as compared to on-site performance for affordable housing, and then just how uh, non-conforming uses are treated and how uh, we may want to implement development agreements as a tool in this uh, land use code amendment. Next slide, please. And uh, lastly, we'll just touch on the public engagement. So um, this is a process for legislative decisions. So process for requirements, including notice of application, the SEPA determination, and the notice of public hearing were followed. Um, throughout the LUCA process, as Trisna noted, we have engaged with property owners within the East Main TOD. Um, this has included Wig Properties, the Bellevue Athletic Club, and j, &J Bellevue um, as an example. Uh, the Surrey Downs neighborhood and Bellcrest neighborhood were also engaged in the process. Um, they have been uh, tracking various issues, uh, some related to building height, uh, transportation impacts, and uh, are, are in support of having uh, uses, generally in support of having uses that are uh, for the neighborhood and serve that community. And then we've also fielded questions from the business community and organizations, including the BDA, about this land use code amendment. Uh, and lastly, we have a webpage for the East Main TOD, so people are able to track the progress of this land use code amendment. And we'll turn it back to Mike to close the staff presentation. Next slide, please. Hey, thanks, Nick. And so at, at this point, um, we are 
since so that wraps up our staff report, handing it back to the council uh, to open the public hearing, uh, unless you have some questions about the presentation materials. And then following the public hearing, if the council has additional topics that you would like us to come add to the list for future discussion and deliberation with the council, uh, as I mentioned, starting in September, um, please, please let us know and we will absolutely add those to the list. Mayor? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'd like to move on with the public hearing unless somebody has a question on process or on something that the staff just presented, but we're gonna hear from the public and we'll have a opportunity to discuss and ask questions at that time and then propose any new ideas that we have not already brought forward to staff because they have a whole list of things they're gonna be bringing back to us. Um, so if, uh, unless I see Otherwise, let's go ahead and uh, is there a motion to open the public hearing? I move to open the public hearing. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So clerk, do we have anybody signed up for the hearing? Yes, thank you, Mayor. We have a number of folks signed up this evening. Um, there are 14 on the pre-registered list. And before I start calling names, I would like to mention that there were three written comments that were submitted to the council and have been included in your desk packet for this evening. So the first speaker on the public hearing list is Laisha Wig. Ms. Wig, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Your time begins now. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. We sent council our seven key requests on the draft land use code on June 25th. We included a table listing each of our requests, the reasons for each request, and indicating the policy support from the comprehensive plan and the council guiding principles under each one. One of our requests is to have lower heights next to 112th, but taller heights next to the freeway and main without penalizing the achievable density on the site. In essence, we have not been requesting more density, but have simply requested to shift density from 112th towards the freeway and Main Street. Under our proposal, the city could get the same amount of housing delivered sooner, but at the same time, allow for a more livable, open, and pedestrian-friendly place. Under the current draft land use code with a 30% minimum housing requirement, either A, no housing would be built in the near term since we would need to wait until rents increase sufficiently to build high rise housing with affordable units or B mid rise housing would be built in the near term and the site would be significantly underdeveloped. This is because under the draft land use code, every building would have to be built to its maximum height to maximize density across from the light rail. In other words, in the draft code, we are not able to recover any density that is lost from building shorter height residential buildings. Under our proposal, we could deliver housing in shorter buildings in the near term and not incur a significant density penalty across from the light rail for doing so. All of our requests center around the ability to develop a thoughtful, vibrant, mixed use place. If we cram density into the area without laying out the buildings to ensure there is proper sunlight, air and ambiance, then the businesses inside are more likely to fail and people will not want to live there. Empty buildings can lead to unsafe places and less use of the transit station across the street. The more thoughtful the design and layout, the more likely that the area will be vibrant and successful. The more vibrant and successful East Main is, the better it is for the community and the city. In short, we believe allowing for shorter heights next to 112th and taller heights next to the freeway and Main Street is not only more respectful of the single family neighborhood to the west, but also leads to the delivery of quicker housing, a more livable community with more open space, light and air and greater ambiance. We hope the count the city will consider all of our requests from our June 25th later. Thank you to staff and council for all of your time and effort on this issue. Thank you, Ms. Wig. The next speaker on the list is Mon Wig. Mr. Wig, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Your okay. time begins now. Thank you. 
Uh, I would like to mention two key items that you can keep in mind during your deliberations on East Main. First item is the importance of a good site plan. Site plan means how the buildings, streets, entrances, parking, et cetera, are laid out. Site plan is one of the most important keys that can make or break a project. A great site can be destroyed by a bad site plan. And site plan cannot be changed easily, so it must be thought through very carefully up front. Fundamentally, we are asking you to allow us to create a better site plan by shifting square feet from west to east. We are not asking for more density. The second item I would like for your attention is to assure that LUCA allows East Main to be competitive. And there are a few items in that would like to discuss the gap between base FAR and max FAR is five times higher in East Main than in OLB South for non-residential and three times higher for residential. Further, amenity points for East Main are more expensive than in OLB South. In addition, block length and perimeter restrictions make convenient parking behind retailers difficult. Such convenient parking is needed for retailers' success. And just for your information, we will incur many development costs that many other sites may not incur. They include creating streets and installing utilities to go to each building that are generally already available on smaller sites. We have high water table and that will require water management. And we would be, we will have noise from both sides, both freeway and transit and controlling noise will be expensive. We know we will have to incur these costs the only reason to mention these items is for you to know that we will have these costs that many other sites may not. Thank you very much for your support to the staff and to the council for all the hard work you have all done. We appreciate it very much and thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Wig. The next speaker is David Slight. Mr. Slight, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Your time begins now. Hello, my name is David Slight. I'm a resident of Surrey Downs, 227 110th Avenue, Southeast. Uh, Mayor Robertson, Deputy Mayor Council, thank you for uh, allowing some public input. I should also make you aware I'm the Secretary of the Surrey Downs Community Club, but these comments are my own. Our community club has a charter to inform our residents, uh, not necessarily to speak for them and I hope many of them will speak for themselves this evening. We obviously have uh, submitted written comments um, and you can read about pedestrian safety, uh, the sky bridges, uh, the 1700 uh, housing units uh, and all of those things which I'm sure other people will refer to, but there's one simple uh, message, not complicated at all, that we have been very clear upon right from the very beginning uh, of our uh, communications around this. And that is that we do not want to have huge tower buildings across the road from our single family residence. I'm extremely pleased that uh, WIG properties have also taken this into consideration and are now asking you for the flexibility to position the highest towers adjacent to the 405 and to have the lower towers along the street on 112th to provide the kind of development that we see already around our single family neighborhood, our main street, etc. Our request is 
my request is quite simple. Uh, having worked, and many thanks to the planning department, who've done a great job of sharing information and educating local residents, but we still do not see clear, hard guidelines in the planning information in the land use code amendments that ensure that these lower heights, uh, whatever the design that's submitted comes in, that the lower heights along 112th uh, create the kind of environment that you're looking for. We just need to make sure those huge towers are by the 405 and not across the tracks from our single family residents. Hopefully, we will be able to pass comment when the actual designs are submitted as well. And we look forward to working with the planning department and WIG properties, etc., over the coming months. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Slade. The next speaker is Jack McCullough. Mr. McCullough, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Charmaine, can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you, your time begins now. Thank you very much. Hello, council members, uh, Jack McCullough, I'm here on behalf of WIG Properties. Um, it's nice to be in front of you talking about East Main again. We've been at this for a long time. And uh, happily, we're here um, kind of in the red zone, time to make final and good decisions on the critical issues in front of us on the zoning. What I wanted to talk about briefly tonight was just uh, the issue of development agreements and what is appropriate and perhaps not for inclusion in a development agreement. Um, as staff indicated, um, a development agreement, I'll call it a DA, is a useful tool and it needs to be part of the East Main toolbox. But we have to be, I think, thoughtful about what we move or push off into the DA bucket and what we make decisions about today. The DA provides flexibility, but we also need to make sure that we've got adequate certainty in the code in front of us. You've heard uh, the, all of the speakers actually preceding me talk about the importance of lower heights along 112th and higher heights uh, on the eastern side of the planning area close to 405. Uh, we've obviously had long conversations with the city about this, and it's been pointed out to us that SEPA might be a problem, that the lack of uh, clear SEPA review of uh, this issue could prevent the inclusion of this, that perhaps these this height modification ought to be deferred to a time when a development agreement could be adopted. A SEPA is a tool to inform decision makers though, and it, it shouldn't be something that just defers a decision that can be made today. I think all of you have seen the memorandum I pre prepared on this topic earlier this year. Um, actually more height on the Eastern side of, of the planning area leads to fewer impacts on the residents to the West across 112th. Uh, which is what those residents are looking for. A SEPA addendum is something that can be accomplished in the next couple months, and we've already provided a lot of the information that can make that happen. So our strong uh, recommendation to the council is that we uh, take the opportunity while we're deliberating on the final portions of this to actually do that SEPA addendum and make a good decision about height. And while we're doing that, I'd suggest in a couple other areas, we look at the same thing, uh, non-conformities, um, this is a large site with development phased over time. Older buildings like Hilton will remain while new ones are developed. Uh, this creates a problem because, uh, because it may suggest that changes need to be made to the Hilton site just in order to develop a separate area of the property. Uh, some of the council members will remember 12 years ago, this is an issue we actually spent a fair amount of time with in the Bell Red rezone, and we developed specific guidance in the Bell Red code to deal with nonconformities. Similarly, in the case of the pre-located street, we want to make sure it doesn't impact Sturdivant Creek. I think these are all issues that we have an opportunity to resolve now in front of us, and we suggest in the time we have this fall that we get that work done. Thank you very much, council members. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Uh, the next speaker is Patrick Bannon. Mr. Bannon, can you hear me? I can, Charmaine, thank you. Great, thank you. Your time begins. My name is Patrick Bannon. I'm president of the Bellevue Downtown Association. Uh, good evening, Mayor Robinson and members of the council, Mr. City Manager. On behalf of the BDA, I just wanted to do a quick check-in on our own progress as this is a topic of high interest for our membership. Uh, our work on East Main will continue through August and September 
led by our Land Use and Livability Committee. And we greatly appreciate the opportunity to hear and incorporate uh, this feedback tonight from stakeholders, from council, from, and, and from the community. So taken together, these viewpoints advance the dialogue and help with our efforts to communicate a position and a set of recommendations prior to council action. Now, we support completing the LUCA on schedule this fall. To date, our committee process has involved several well-attended briefings with city staff. The Q&As and member discussions following each presentation touched on recurring themes, themes you're, you're familiar with. They included key points about market needs and realities and the relationship to the code, the desired mix of uses and capacities for each, housing and proposed requirements, building heights, urban form, FARs and the incentive system. And of course, the urgency to complete this work. Like the city council's review, our focus involves evaluating the LUCA for how it delivers on the vision, goals, and policies of the 2019 CPA. We can agree on the enormous potential for East Main's transition to a vibrant, walkable neighborhood, well served by high capacity transit and other modes. East Main is unique for Bellevue. It's adjacencies to downtown zoning, major arterials, light rail, I-405, and the single family neighborhoods all present strengths and complexities. We wanna to acknowledge tonight the work of city staff as expected, they've shown readiness and professionalism in briefing our committee. And we'll call again on them soon. Uh, as noted above, the BDA's committee process will continue through September, working toward a BDA recommendation prior to council approval on the LUCA. Thanks again for your careful study and ongoing leadership behind this major planning issue and a major opportunity for our city's future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bannon. The next speaker on the list is Alex Brennan. Mr. Brennan, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Mm. Mr. Brennan, we do not have a good connection with you. Can you, uh, I'm gonna try to mute you and then unmute again. Can you say something now? No, unfortunately, I think you have a bad connection. I would suggest disconnecting from the meeting and reconnecting, and I'll circle back to you. Okay. The next speaker on the list is Bill Thurston. Mr. Thurston, can you hear me? Mr. Thurston, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Your time oh. begins now. Thank you very much. Um, Mayor Robertson and members of the council, I wanna thank you for this opportunity to speak to the council. And on behalf of the Bellevue Cup, we wish to commend the council and the city staff in their efforts as quickly as possible to bring to conclusion the resolution, a suitable code to support the vision and success of the TOD. The Bellevue Club is mentioned previously as a unique destination community and a landmark property for this area. We're not a commercial area. Our goal is to protect and enhance our community for generations ahead. To accomplish this, we will need the effective use of our remaining property that must be supported by market-driven options that create a property that enhances the value for belonging to this community and supports the broad vision of ACE Link. And we have mentioned many of these things previously, and we I don't feel a need at this time to go over those, but uh, I think members of the council and the staff had heard our special needs. Um, in order for our development and those of the commercial area to be successful, this district needs to be competitive with other alternatives and um, which Mr. Wig has mentioned. The East Main land code needs to be fair and allow this to be successful. Unfortunately, the, the code is punitive and provides more restrictions to the downtown or the Bell Red codes. And Mr. Wig gave him examples of this, such as the gap between the base and max FAR is five times higher in East Main than in the adjacent zones to the north. We hope to see 
block length strengthened and more amenable parameter restrictions to support a more walkable and flexible space for pedestrian and other developments. We encourage that the disparities in these areas be ironed out at this time so that this whole TOD area becomes an area that must be welcoming, livable, and iconic. So I want to thank the council and the staff for all of these considerations, and we hope to work closely with everyone in concluding this uh, most successfully. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thurston. Mr. Brennan, I see that you disconnected and reconnected. Let's try your audio one more time. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me better now? So much better. Thank you. Your time begins now. Wonderful. Um, well, good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. My name is Alex Brennan. I'm the Executive Director of FutureWise. FutureWise works throughout the state on issues of environmental sustainability, affordable housing, and healthy, equitable communities. And we do that through the lens of our State Growth Management Act. I'm excited to be working in Bellevue alongside local nonprofit, affordable housing and service providers, resident advocates, and the local business community to advance affordable housing through the newly forming Eastside Housing Roundtable, which we'll be hearing more about in the near future. Um, this is a moment of great opportunity for Bellevue. Uh, Eastlink is opening in just a few years. And while offices from Manhattan to Houston sit vacant in the aftermath of the pandemic, in Bellevue, demand is booming. Bellevue has a real opportunity to accommodate that demand and provide public benefit by offering added development capacity near light rail stations in exchange for affordable housing. East Main is just one of several station areas where you can use the strategy to add affordable housing to help workers of all income levels live closer to the tens of thousands of jobs that we know are coming and also help reduce greenhouse gas emissions and traffic congestion. I hope that you will fully explore how to best take advantage of this height for affordable housing strategy while being mindful of transitions to adjacent neighborhoods as you finalize your plans for this area. Providing housing for all incomes near jobs and transit centers will help create a walkable, livable, sustainable future for Bellevue and the entire East Side. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. The next speaker on the list is Paul Weller. Mr. Weller, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Um, barely. If you could speak up, your time will begin now. Okay. Hello, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Council Members. My name is Paul Weller. We own a house located at 248 111th Avenue Southeast in Surrey Downs neighborhood. For reference, if we walked out my back door onto my back deck, my view has a picture-perfect frame of the East Main TOD. My property, in my view, will be one of the most significantly affected in Surrey Downs. I come with a different perspective to the heights and densities that you may think coming from a single-family home. I'm a licensed civil engineer and AIC planner, and I have a desire for a city that is sustainable, accessible, and vibrant. I provide my comments tonight with the context of doing the right thing for our city, the region, and our environment. In the staff reports of Luca, it states that East Main is to employ a transportation system that achieves mobility and safety while also protecting the adjacent lower density neighborhoods from negative traffic impacts. It also states that it is envisioned to comfortably span the changing character from downtown to the low density residential neighborhood west of 112th Avenue Southeast. This is considerate, but I wanna make this very clear. Single family zones do not need protection and single family zones should not be considered in making significant land use changes to a transit oriented development site. We, will, we really have one chance to make this right, and we should not be con, not provide consideration to single family zones for height transition, density, traffic demands, and land uses when making these significant zone, zoning changes that not don't just affect us, but our whole region and our environment. Giving too much consideration to single family zones will create unintended consequences and will not provide the desired outcome that we, we need for a transit-oriented development site. For example, if the height of the whole site is capped at 250 with a step-down transition height of 50 feet close to 112 and a density far of five, then the, de then the developer would not have the flexibility to move structures. 
the city should not put into place restrictions that would require the developer to choose between two desired outcomes. The developer should be provided the flexibility in the land use code to allow for the necessary height to achieve both desired objectives. Another example of an unintended consequence is requiring a fire density in a 30% minimum residential housing density. Rather than re requiring the housing density, the city should place in incentives which should strongly encourage housing rather than require it. Let's use the carrot rather than the stick in this situation. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker this evening is Jane Broom. Yeah, Ms. Broom, can you hear me? Ms. Broom, can you hear me? Hello? There you are. Thank you. Sorry. Your time begins now. Sorry about that. Thank you. Good evening, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm Jane Broom uh, with Microsoft Philanthropies. It is great to see you all. You've had a lively discussion tonight. Microsoft's $750 million affordable housing initiative is our commitment to help advance affordable housing solutions across the east side in cities like Bellevue. As part, we work with local governments, communities, nonprofits, and businesses to adopt practical, inclusive, and responsible policies that will result in more housing options for people across income levels. As job grows across the east side, we need to ensure the people who work here can live here too. We appreciate the leadership in action from the city of Bellevue and this council in particular to implement its 2017 affordable housing strategy and consider more ways the city can go further. The East Main Rezone represents a once in a lifetime opportunity for Bellevue. The chance to rethink 60 acres of mostly contiguous land that is close to downtown and right across from a soon to open light rail station cannot be understated. We know the site will add more jobs, but we need it to add more housing too. The opportunity for new market rate and affordable housing adjacent to transit must be prioritized and maximized every step of the way. For the city of Bellevue, if not here, then where? Getting the right Getting this right requires all of us to continue working together with focus and urgency. Along with strong leadership from the Bellevue Chamber, we are proud to be part of a growing coalition called the Eastside Housing Roundtable, a group of private sector and nonprofit organizations that are focused solely on increasing affordable housing in Bellevue. We thank the mayor, council, the city and staff leadership for their continued focus on East Maine and strongly support the work being done to get this across the finish line in a way that ensures on-site housing production will be a top priority. Thank you for all you have done and will continue to do to help keep Bellevue affordable. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Broom. The next speaker is Joe Fain. Mr. Fain, can you hear me? Yes, are you able to hear me? Yes, thank you. Your time begins now. Great, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor and members of the council, Joe Fain, uh, President and CEO of the Bellevue Chamber. Um, really appreciate the amount of time and energy that has been spent, uh, not just on this issue, but on all of the issues pertaining to development and in particular affordable housing uh, that this council has prioritized over the last several months. Um, I want to, of course, start by thanking staff. They've done an extraordinary job of, of um, putting together uh, a document that provides a lot of guidance for prioritizing um, things that I think we all value, in particular affordable housing. Um, we at the chamber are working uh, hard to review some of the economic um, analysis that the city has done to partner with staff to vet different uh, options for the for incentivizing uh, additional um, development of housing. And we'll be bringing forward uh, more information about that as we continue our work uh, and as we continue our work through the housing roundtable. Uh, one thing that I wanted to uh, leave you with in with regards to housing is it's an interesting 
uh, it's an interesting conundrum in that there are really three elements of, of housing that are policy decisions. And the first is, is it the jobs housing imbalance that is the, is the issue, or is it just the sheer number of unit count that is the issue, or is it affordability that's the issue? Um, for a development like this, uh, thus far, it seems like those second factors, the overall unit count and prioritizing affordability are the things that can be best served uh, by embracing greater heights uh, adjacent to 114th in the freeway. And so we would encourage the council to um, uh, evaluate that. And if there's anything that needs to be done during the August uh, recess uh, with staff in terms of evaluation of SEPA or other things to ensure that there's a decision package that contemplates some of those higher heights, we would certainly encourage direction to do that. Um, we've valued our partnership with the council and particularly with staff. Uh, they've been extraordinarily accessible to both the chamber and the BDA as well as other uh, community groups. Uh, and we appreciate that ongoing partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fain. The next speaker on the list is Jacqueline Gruber. Ms. Gruber, can you hear me? Yep, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, your time begins now. Great, thank you for the opportunity to comment this evening. My name is Jacqueline Gruber and I'm here today representing Vulcan and I'm a participating member of the Eastside Housing Roundtable. Vulcan is an office and multifamily helper. We currently have 2 million square feet of office development in Bellevue's downtown and are excited, excited to be permitting for two additional multifamily buildings. We continue to look for more multifamily sites. The co-barriers in Bellevue can sometimes make multifamily housing challenging. Ultimately, we need both office development and residential development in order to achieve the jobs to housing balance necessary for a healthy city. This is why we are commenting tonight. We applaud the City Council's recent changes to the MFTE ordinance to help incentivize residential development in multifamily areas. This was an important and forward-looking first step. The city should implement additional code changes to encourage housing development in order to meet existing and future demand. East Main is a great opportunity to bring more housing to Bellevue, if done correctly. The vision for this area is transit-oriented development where residents are a short light rail ride from our region's major employers. To achieve this vision, the code must carefully be crafted to avoid overly prescriptive design standards, which sacrifice potential housing floor area for aesthetics. Code barriers that are in other areas of the city, like specific road locations, housing minimums, setbacks, and floor plate limits should not be implemented. To maximize housing production, the incentive zoning program should focus on granting higher bonus heights and bonus FAR with a formula that supports on-site construction of affordable housing at 80% AMI. We must do the math necessary to make sure that the incentive structure will function and should consider options like payments in lieu. We thank the city for acting quickly on these code changes so that staff can turn their attention to other pressing initiatives to unlock housing production in Bellevue, including the downtown and Bell Red Lookbacks and the Wolverton Upzone. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Gruber. The next speaker on the list is Jared Axelrod. Mr. Axelrod, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great, your time begins now. Great, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Newenhouse, members of the council. My name is Jared Axelrod and I lead local public policy with Amazon. Here to speak in support of the land use code amendment for uh, East Main Station area. <clears throat> As you heard me share at previous meetings, Amazon believes that all people should have access to housing that they can afford. And we will continue to work with governments uh, like the Bellevue City Council to implement more effective housing policies to help deliver on this mission. The land use code changes for East Main are a significant step in Bellevue toward making the necessary changes to bring quality, market rate, and affordable housing to our community. The benefits of this land use code change are especially significant due to its proximity to the soon to open East Main Station. As you saw in our announcement uh, with our partnership with Sound Transit back in June, Amazon strongly believes in the values and benefits of transit-oriented development, which has a range of benefits, including greater economic activity, reduced traffic congestion, and a more resilient labor force. I want to offer a few items for your consideration this evening. First, allowing more height, especially closer to 405 and, and along 114th Avenue Southeast in exchange for more affordable housing is a solid policy. This can help the city meet its affordable housing goals and ensure proper transitions to the nearby neighborhoods, all while maximizing the number of units on site. Second, the policy should strongly uh, incentivize on-site performance to create vibrant, walkable, transit-oriented zones. New light rail stations do not open every day and do not open in every neighborhood in our region. Suffice to say, there is only one shot to get this right. 
the policies must build enticing incentive structures that work to best maximize on-site performance. However, if appropriate and absolutely necessary, in-lieu fees should also be on the table so that we can continue to grow the supply of affordable housing in Bellevue. It's important that land use code changes like this or for other neighborhoods the city will soon consider continue to explore the full range of location appropriate tools that work best to produce housing at all income levels. Last, I just wanted to thank the council for your work, uh, continued work over several months and years on this matter. As you all know, this has been a long time in the process and we appreciate your continued commitment to transit oriented development and affordable housing in Bellevue. We, along with several of the other partners who you've heard uh, to this evening, are happy to work with you and your staff over the next several weeks and months to finalize this land use code amendment. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Axelrod. The next speaker on the list is Troy Draws. Mr. Draws, can you hear me? I can, thank you, Charmaine. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council and staff. My name is Troy Draws, and I'm here tonight on behalf of Imagine Housing, a member of the East Side Housing Roundtable to support the proposed land use code amendment for the East Main Station area. I'll keep my comments very brief. Uh, we encourage the city to use this opportunity to further achieve Bellevue's affordable housing goals through support of the following. Number one, maximize building height near the freeway. Number two, trading building height for additional affordable housing as feasible to create a diverse range of residential options at a variety of affordability levels. And lastly, number three, creating a livable, walkable, and sustainable Bellevue by focusing on open space and amenities rather than block length limits. Thank you for your time and consideration this evening. Thank you, Mr. Draws. The final speaker on the pre-registered list is Patience Malaba. Ms. Malaba, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Your time begins now. Good evening, uh, Mayor Robinson and council members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. For the record, I am Patience Malaba. Director of Government Relations and Policy at the Housing Development Consortium of Seattle King County. We are a membership association with rep which represents nonprofit organizations, uh, public partners, and private businesses who are working to develop affordable housing across our King County region. The East Main Luca is a tremendous uh, TOD opportunity path that demands a bold approach to the regulatory provisions such as height and FAR, while making sure that you maximize on public benefit by feathering city goals on affordable housing. We are asking you to trade height only for affordable housing. We encourage you to prioritize on-site performance uh, of housing through incentives, but we also request you to move forward an analysis on a fee in lieu program as has been requested by the WIG properties that can ensure that the growth provides housing for diverse household sizes and income levels consistent with the city's 2017 affordable housing strategy. Ensuring that enough affordable homes are built in Bellevue will always have positive implications for social equity and for the local economy strength. When workers can walk or take transit to work, we all benefit. We all benefit from better air quality and less greenhouse gas emissions. These are outcomes that we all want. It's a vision that we all share. This is your leadership moment. And we ask that you advance a LUCA that makes this vision a reality. Thank you for all your work in serving the residents of Bellevue. Thank you, Ms. Malaba. And I do not see anyone else connected to this meeting currently that has not already provided comment to the council. So Mayor, we would be ready to close the public hearing at this point. Okay, is there a motion to close the public hearing? I move to close the public hearing. All Fair. those in favor, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? <clears throat> okay. Um, We've been going for a long time without a break here, and I, I hate to break mid, but that we could go on for a while here. So I'm going to ask that we take a uh, break until 9.15 and resume discussion of this. Tonight we're talking about further direction 
on this. We've had a lot of discussions and we've given recommendations to staff. And now after hearing the public comment, staff is looking for further direction. I wonder, Mike, um, I think you had a chart of things that we've already, direction we've already given you. Is it possible to put that back up? I don't, I don't hear you, Mike. I'm sorry. Um, that was operator error. Sorry about that. Um, so the uh, if you bring the PowerPoint back up, we can take you to the slide that uh, kind of identifies the high level um, uh, items that were included in the council direction at the June 28th meeting. So I don't know if uh, Trisna or Charmaine was bringing that up. Charmaine, thank you. And uh, continue down. We'll get to that slide. It's uh, slide 11. There we go. So these this uh, represents um, the topics, um, kind of the major topic areas that were um, representing the uh, items requested by stakeholders for changes and other suggestions made by the council uh, for further deliberation or consideration. Okay, so I mean, we're not talking about this tonight and we haven't had a chance to discuss this, but if there is something on the list that's not on the list that you would like to add after hearing the presentation and hearing the public comments, this is our chance to do it. So I'm going to um, go back to the gallery view so I can see everybody. And I see Deputy Mayor and I see Council Member Robertson. Um, so let's start with you. And I see um, Council Member Lee and Council Member Barksdale. So let's go ahead and, okay, hold on. <laughs> Sorry, hold on for just a sec. See if I can do this. This is like concentration. Okay, so I've got Deputy Mayor, uh, Council Member Robertson, Council Member Lee, Council Member Barksdale, Council Member Zahn uh, so far. And so we'll start with Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. And I uh, just wanted to say, uh, Mike and team, great presentation tonight. Thanks for the uh, the overview and to get us grounded in this once again uh, on, on East Main. And I really want to thank all the uh, participants this uh, this evening for uh, weighing on this as well. We heard a lot of great comments. And uh, I know personally for me, there was a couple of items there that I wanted to, to highlight, Mike. And there's about, I think, five or six items here um, that I would request to be added, but they might already be included in one of those topic areas. So there might be some overlap there. So um, I'll go through them quickly and you can tell them if they're already included or not, or if it would be something that um, might be interested in adding. So I believe one of the stakeholders mentioned site plan. Is that included already? Uh, if not, that seems like something that uh, should come back before us in uh, September. I think we heard over and over again about keeping the height um, near 405. I think we heard that from both the residents of Surrey Downs as well as some stakeholders here. So I think that's something that uh, clearly there's a, an appetite for that, you know, those higher heights near 405. Um, also curious about the, I believe it was seven requests, and I think this came directly from uh, one of the stakeholders, uh, perhaps with properties that asked us to take a look at and ensure that those were included in the uh, future study session topics. And then three more. Um, one is the, and it, I didn't hear a lot of it about tonight, but it came up once before, and that's about the amenity incentive system. And the requirements being placed on the East Main property owners uh, different when compared to downtown and Bell Red. I think that might be interesting um, to take a look at, especially as I think the council gave direction, boy, a while back to look at using downtown as kind of that 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 base um, Luca code, and then moving forward from that. So if there is a big discrepancy, I think it'd be interesting to 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 know why or why it's different. Um, I think this one is already covered, and that's the the gap between the base and the max far. Um, you know, five times higher than uh, OLB South for non-residential, but then three times higher for residential, um, if I have that right. So it's so it's a different uh, base far for residential and for residential and non non-residential. I'm just curious to know a little bit more about that. 
Um, oh, and then lastly, it's the pre-located street, which I believe we heard a little bit about tonight. And again, curious how that works with the downtown code, because my understanding is uh, that in the downtown code, the property owners um, get bonus points or far bonus points if they create a pedestrian corridor. So I'm curious as how that's different East Main compared to downtown once again. So I'll turn it over to you, but those are some of the uh, items that I either hear tonight or had uh, written down that I think would be useful to come back as a topic for a future study session. So um, a number of those were in already included in the list. If you'll recall, there was a table uh, at the June 28th um, study session of the mm -hmm. uh, items identified by the wigs that you mentioned were included in that table. So those would be brought forward. The site plan question, um, um, uh, Mr. Wig was commenting about the importance of, of, of being able to lay out a, a, a good site plan. It was critical to the success, success of a project. And there are so many elements that really drive the ability to lay the property out. And a number of those are addressed in the um, some of the decisions have already made with regard to the, the block sizes, the um, et cetera. So we'll try to tee up on that topic area, those things that influence yeah. the site plan or the ability to lay out the, pro the property, um, building locations and the things that drive that. Um, again, there are many things that, that have an influence, including floor plate size, maximums, right. et cetera. So yeah. um, that one was a little, that might be a little tricky, but we'll, we'll try to do something with that to, to really work through, um, you know, what is the flexibility that's provided and where are the boundaries of that flexibility um, with, it, with respect to the site plan. Um, as far as the, the others, um, looking at some of the comparisons to the downtown that wasn't included in any of the previous uh, request. So that's an analysis that we would need to set up and bring back for you. Um, so we can certainly put that on the list as well. Um, if you want to do comparisons to downtown and uh, Bell Red for um, base FAR against the max FAR, uh, et cetera. There are a number of different drivers in those areas of the city that are different than East Main. Every area has got a kind of a unique set of circumstances. Sure. We'll try to describe those as well. So we can uh, we can absolutely add those to the list of topics that we can bring back for additional discussion and uh, description. Thank you. Hey, Council Member Robertson. Great, I'll try to be brief since we have two more agenda items tonight. Um, so I, Mike, Question, are any of the comments that we received tonight with regard to revisions not included in the land use code um, topic areas that council will address? Um, that's a challenging question. So I'm trying to recall all the comments. So um, I'm scanning my notes. I think uh, I didn't hear anything that was dramatically outside of what we've already got on the list. Um, lots of discussion about housing, the balance of housing, incentivizing housing and affordable housing, heights and pushing the maximum heights up along the freeway or the, the east side of the property. So all of those are in line with some of the topic areas that we've already um, have on the list to bring back for council discussion. So I, I don't recall anything that was new and unique this evening from the commenters. Okay, and I would encourage all the people who commented to feel free to send in your comments and writing to the council so we can track them because we're gonna be studying this for a while. Um, second, are any of the seven items that are on the WIGS June, I think it was 25th letter, not going to be covered in the study sessions that council is having? So I believe we, I don't have a letter in front of me, I'm just trying to do it from memory, but I believe we've captured all of those requests in that table that I referred to that uh, had the, the yellow and the green boxes uh, from the June 28th meeting. So okay. the answer to your question is yes, I believe we've captured all of their, their items. Great, great, you're telling me everything I wanna hear. Um, third, on the amenities, this is one thing I think we need do need to add to the extent it's not already included. I would definitely like to see a broader look at the amenity system adding more amenities. The one I'm most particularly interested in making a high point amenity is the pedestrian overcrossing bridge. I think that's going to be a very, very important connection and it's expensive. 
Um, and it's going to make the light rail work better. It's going to make this development work better. It's going to give people access to downtown, et cetera. So that is one that I definitely want to see us put in the amenity system. So I'd like to make sure that we're looking at the amenity list. And the amenity list is on here, but is that, either, can you either add it or tell me it's already included? Um, Deputy Mayor Newenhouse also suggested a closer look at the amenity incentive system and some comparisons. So yes, it's on the list. Great. And then finally, I'd like to, I, I, I agree, I mentioned it at the last council meeting, I would like to see um, us do whatever we need to do under SEPA, whether it's a, whether a look by the staff results in a DNS or whether it requires an addendum. But it sounds, and we will listen to the rest of the council, of course, but based on the overwhelming comments we had tonight and a definite interest on the part of council at looking at higher heights and shifting heights, if staff feels like we need to revisit SEPA, let's do it now because we should be able to do that addendum in 90 to 120 days if an addendum is needed. Um, so I don't know what direction you need from council to do that. I just don't want to get to November and, and have to start that process then. So you can maybe weigh in on that and tell us what you need um, to kick that off. Right. So the, this is a, a comment that was made uh, during the last study session about trying to make sure that we are um, pushing forward some of the conversations and decisions that could trigger a need to look at the SEPA analysis or the comp plan um, policies again and do that as early as possible. So we are absolutely um, working to do that. Um, I, I think um, as far as the, the SEPA analysis is concerned, I think the height clearly is one item that, that could require us to take another look at that. Uh, but again, we'll need to figure out where the council uh, is going to land before we bring the consultant back in if that's necessary to actually do the analysis, et cetera, or to support that work. So I guess at this point on that question, it doesn't require any direction from the council. That would be a, a staff initiated analysis and decision uh, for the SEPA. But um, the, the direction was clear during the study session in June that let's initiate that as at the earliest possible point to minimize any extension of the time it would take to process this code amendment. Okay, so just as a quick follow up and then I'll let it, someone else talk. I, I've heard council member or Deputy Mayor Newenhouse and myself will say we wanna look at a higher height than is currently under the SEPA. I, I hope that as my colleagues talk tonight, if council is interested in looking at that, you will share that tonight before we go on break so that staff can decide while we're on break if that's something they need to do. So thanks. Okay, um, I'm going to call in this order. Councilmember Lee, um, Councilmember Barksdale's on, and Stokes. So, Councilmember Lee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'm really uh, uh, excited to hear all the support uh, that we heard from the community, uh, especially people who are really, uh, you know, affected directly by housing uh, to provide for uh, the added, uh, you know. Uh, uh, people who will be working, coming to work for the city. So uh, uh, very gratified. Uh, second, um, I heard that, uh, you know, in a way, uh, the Wix Properties uh, proposal, uh, as they presented to us uh, back in June, uh, they, they brought us seven points. It seems to me that as I heard from the staff and uh, you already are, are including those, right? So I don't think we're missing anything. And so, but I just want to emphasize uh, that somebody heard from the testimony that we're looking at something iconic. And I think that's very important. Uh, as a result, I believe I support uh, my fellow council members who mentioned about height. And I feel that, you know, we talk about a lot about housing, housing, and uh, if we can increase our density uh, by, you know, going higher. And I think in this case, uh, I'm very much convinced that uh, height near the freeway away from the uh, Surrey Downs neighborhood, uh, you know, if we can achieve that by reducing the height closer to the neighborhood, uh, I think that would not only provide us with more density for housing, but also would provide us uh, iconic uh, gateway uh, coming to Bellevue, you know, from the light rail. And I, I see, you know, when the Wix property presented their 
um, sketch. Uh, I, I think that uh, you know variety of the development uh, really present us that uh, multimodal connection uh, to the light rail and to the neighborhood and eventually to Wilberton. Uh, I believe that uh, this is really, and of course, it's, I think that's her, uh, Councilman Robinson mentioned, you know, we could also make connection to downtown, uh, you know, conveniently with uh, ways of like uh, uh, Sky Bridge or Corridor or various other ways, you know, even uh, maybe underground tunnels. Uh, so I, I think there's a variety of things we can make the connection. So I support it and I hope uh, staff can confirm that those items that were presented, included by Works Poverty, uh, will be discussed. Yes, Councilman, I believe those, those items, we'll confirm that, but I'm, I'm um, pretty certain that they're already- Thank you. On the list. Now, one what, 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 what concluding, just to be clarified, you know, the urban farm is really the thing that stand out for me. And I think that's where we talk about before with the staff, we have some real strong, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't want to use contention, <laughs> but the difference in urban farms. I want to really clarify it that I personally support uh, the they suggested uh, height increase. Uh, if, uh, you know, we're talking about urban farm, if we can make it iconic, make it workable, uh, accomplish your goals, uh, I, I support it. Thank you, Mike. Okay, Council Member Barksdale. All right, thank you, Mayor. Um, so thank you to staff and for the public and to the public for their comments. My, my interest was also in the amenity and uh, incentive system, uh, amenity incentive system, but I had a couple of new things that I wanted to include in that. Um, one is uh, mom and pop shops and how we can incentivize those, um, especially given um, supporting commercial services as part of the vision, but also just given the need for affordable commercial spaces. Um, and then secondly, uh, other amenities that um, promote sense of belonging um, and engagement uh, among people who, are, who either live, work, or play in that space, which I think helps support the informal gathering spaces and unique character. Um, and in terms of uh, considering the uh, shifting the height closer to the highway, um, I'm interested in learning more about that to Council Member Robertson's question. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Zahn. Yes, um, thank you, Mayor. You know, I appreciate all of the feedback and comments that we've received so far. I believe housing is the key and that time is of the essence. So I guess here's a couple of things. One is I agree with um, Council Member Barksdale that to the degree we could look at affordable retail as an amenity and in, that we can incentivize would be really important to me. And then my question would be, on the height, you know, what height would pencil out so that we can actually build more housing um, and increase height along 405? And specifically, what I heard the Whigs talk about is that based on what they could charge for rent, it may be that it won't be affordable if we are not able to provide more height. So I'm just trying to understand a bit more about how much height are we talking about? I believe in our packet wig one, the possible adjustment we're looking at is only going to a height of 300 with 320 with mechanical. So are we actually going to um, evaluate and analyze up to 400 feet as part of the SEPA review? Uh, Cause I, I would like to think that if we're gonna um, pursue SEPA and looking at an amendment that we don't end up going to that well too many times, that we really do try to look at what is the height that we um, are looking for in order to incent the, uh, the housing piece. So those are the things that I'm thinking about. Uh, thank you. Any, uh, can we move on, Mike? Did you wanna make any comment? Yeah, I think a um, real brief comment here, a uh, response to council member Zahn's comment about height. So the, the question about height and, and the balance between adding the ability to maximize the density and development and what you get for that. It's the public benefit side. 
is is a is the equation really, um, and that's what you've heard a number of the commenters talking about to to try to make sure that what happens here does kind of maximize the ability to accomplish the public benefit, which in in this case we're talking about the affordable housing public benefit. So when we're talking about height and, and housing, they kind of go together, and I, I understand as well that the Whigs are looking at it the same way, and that's that's the, the case that they've made um, as well. So that will be definitely part of the council discussion. Great. Uh, council Member Stokes. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I think it's a really great discussion tonight. I think the, actually, um, I was very glad to hear almost everybody saying what I've said, I think the last two times we've had this is, uh, I think we're looking at, well, one, we need to have affordable housing there. I don't know why we're even talking about Thea and Lou, uh, because that will mean no affordable housing at a TOD site. And I, I just can't see us doing that. Uh, but clearly, as I said before, I'm very willing to go higher if we get affordable housing. Um, and that is a prime directive and everybody, almost everybody coming and talk to us uh, said that. Um, I do think we need to look at a couple of things. One is uh, I'd, like, I'd like more uh, first um, discussion of what does it really mean that we can't pencil out if we don't get a certain height and why? I mean, I'd like to know, I mean, if that's easy to say. I'd like to have us understand that uh, from several sources. Um, I mean, if I were doing a development, I'd probably say the same thing. And it's probably true, but I just like, I would like to have some confirmation of that. So we're talking about realities. The second factor is that we all have to keep in mind is this is a game changing decision for Bellevue. The question of, and the question that the deputy mayor raised about a downtown, well, you know, we could just not have the wedding cake anymore. We could have a, uh, a you know, a, a, a um, what do you call it? A, uh, a level cake. Um, I mean, we could be like some cities that don't really have any uh, guidance or that don't have zones. We have zones and there are reasons for them. So, but we can make adjustments. So it's, it's we're at a point where we, we're looking at the way we've done it this way, the way it's been successful, the way you have the zones and are we going to do something different? We're crossing the, the zone, we're crossing the freeway. So I think we have to look at the reality that if we, whatever we do here, we're gonna have the same request coming across the freeway on both sides up there. We're gonna have it in other places. Why not in part of Bell Red? So I, I think that's, that's just the reality is that if we, we can't go with one developer on something because it's really special, and not look at others. So this is a big decision and I'm not afraid to make it, but I think I want I want us to really take a hard look at this and say, is this where we wanna go in Bellevue? Um, and what do we get for it? And if we do that, we really have to look at, make sure that the public benefit really is addressed. The public benefit's not just building a nice building for, for us. Public, you know, there's a lot of other factors. So. I think we're on a good path and I've said it before, I'm willing to go high uh, for affordable, real affordable housing. And I don't consider a hundred percent for a condo. Uh, it doesn't sound like a good message about what affordable housing is when we have real need for workforce housing and that type of thing. So uh, those are the things I'd like to look at. I, you know, I don't really know why we would we even want to, well, I guess we can discuss the in but I just don't see that as an option for this site because this is a TOD site and we have, we have plans, we have, uh, you know, uh, the code and everything for a reason. And um, so I'm looking forward to these other conversations. I hope we can have these and get something done before this is, um, you know, 2025. That's okay. just a joke, but uh, <laughs> it could be a reality. I'm ready to go forward and I think we're looking at the right things, but let's do them as in a good, um, Good fashion and do it, um, not not taking forever and changing every time we have a conversation. Well, we have to go back and retalk something else. So let's get our ducks in a row. Let's look at this real hard, and be be willing to make some bold changes, but for a the return to the public 
that is that would um, would uh, pay for that essentially. Okay, thank you. So you know, I I want to say to staff how much I appreciate the different attention we give to the different parts of Bellevue, the Bell Red, the downtown, the East Main. I mean, Wilburton, Eastgate, we have a large planning process and we have a visioning process for all those areas that is unique. And uh, I think that this piece of property is very unique. We've already discussed about it. I'm gonna go back to what I said three years ago. <laughs> Can't believe we've been talking about this long, but I want good architecture. I want affordable housing, as Councilmember Stokes says, at 80% or less AMI. I don't want fee and lieu here because if we can't put affordable housing right across the street from a transit, from a light rail station, I don't know where we can. And I want it to be walkable and bikeable. And I'm willing to, I think you're, the concept is shifting the FAR. I don't know if that's true, but I mean, going lower in the front and higher in the back. I'm willing to, you know, lower the requirements for the residential and increase the opportunity for office or whatever the um, east buildings are. So I'm okay with uh, increasing the height. And if we can get a SEPA review as soon as possible on that, I think it will help because I, I feel like there's support from the council on examining the possibilities of increasing the height on the east side. And I don't want it to get hung up too much on that. But I don't know if I'm saying anything new that you haven't heard before in direction, but I think I've been pretty consistent with that. So uh, do you feel like you've gotten the direction that you need, Mike, tonight? Yes, I, I appreciate the extra explanation and suggestions. I, I think we've got a pretty comprehensive list. We will organize that in a way that um, Makes logical sense, I think. Uh, clearly, housing will probably be at the front end of the discussion with the council um, because what falls after that is how do we make sure that uh, it can be accomplished within the development area, um, both from a physical and an economic standpoint. So uh, I think we've got um, pretty strong and clear direction from the council. So I appreciate that. Great. Okay, we have two, we have uh, two study session items, and I. Uh, well, we have three, but two, two discussion ones. And I want you to look at, I'm going to ask council to look at the recommended motion here. And if you agree with that, let's just vote on it. And if you don't, or you want to change it, uh, let's go ahead and have that discussion. But it's, we've got almost 15 minutes here. I would love to get through this. Um, so. Staff, do you, I know you have a full presentation to do, so um, let's go. We are fine with your direction, ma'am, uh, Mayor. Uh, if, if council is good to go without the presentation, we're fine. If whichever direction you'd like to go, Mayor, we well, are we are supportive. I, I'm not saying not to do the presentation. I think that's really important. I'm just talking okay. about the discussion after. So thank you, gotcha. Tony. Go I, ahead. I misunderstood, ma'am. Sorry. That's right. I was ready. <laughs> I know. So go ahead with the presentation. Or Mr. Miyake, would you like to introduce this? Sorry. No, Mayor, given the, the hour and the time, I'm going to go directly to Tony and go ahead and start the presentation, Tony. <clears throat> I will do that. I just It just unclosed for me, so I'm going to continue to speak as it comes up, and I will share as soon as we get there. This evening, uh, we are seeking direction to bring back, we're discussing ARPA, and we are seeking direction to bring back uh, on consent next week. And here's the presentation. I apologize for losing it. I hit the wrong button. <laughs> That's what happens when we get ourselves moving too fast here, I believe. Yeah. Uh, share screen. You should be able to see that, there I you hope. Go. Yeah, perfect. Here. All right. We are seeking direction this evening to bring back on consent uh, appropriate legislation, including budget amendments and authorization to contract for up to eight million of the ARPA funding. Uh, this is our agenda for this evening. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, the 
uh, ARPA passed into law March 11th in 2021, and it allocated about $1.9 trillion uh, for, across a variety of programs intended to address economic, social, and public health impacts. The top paragraph, you can see where 70% of those funding went, uh, leaving about 30% for the things you see on the bottom half of this slide. Tonight, we are focused on the bold bullet at the bottom, which describes uh, about $350 billion that came to state and local government. Of that, the city of Bellevue will receive approximately $20 million. We received the first $10 million tranche about a month ago, or a little bit less than that, and the second $10 million tranche will come in 2022. The interim guidance is very clear. It must be spent on respond and responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, whether it's to the public health emergency or its negative economic impacts, providing premium paid essential worker. There's clauses that allow us to recoup some of the reduction loss that we lost through COVID-19, and it also allows for investments in water, sewer, and broadband. It's important to note that uh, the money must be incurred or contracted by December 31st, 24, and must be spent by December 31st, 2026. In front of you tonight is a proposal uh, for us to meet our most critical immediate needs in the community, focusing on housing and workforce stability. I'll turn it over to Tony Esparza and Jesse Canado in just a minute. The rec before, recommendation before you asks that we appropriate up to $8 million of the $20 million ARPA funding, leaving and holding on to in abeyance the remaining $12 million till a later date. We all know with COVID, um, gosh, every time we turn around, there's something new and unexpected. So holding those funds in abeyance for a later time is a uh, smart fiscal policy. So with that, Tony, I'm going to head it straight over to you to talk about rent and evictions. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council Members. Um, I'll be sharing the data that is informing our recommendation for the allocation of dollars towards eviction prevention and housing stability, and also providing a brief overview of how the dollars might be used to support our residents. Our recommendation for prioritizing ho housing stability assistance is informed by the data that is gathered by our human services team on current community needs. While the pandemic has continued to cause need in a variety of areas, the data demonstrated that needs related to housing stability were the most urgent. The city has been responsive to the need for eviction prevention funds throughout the pandemic. In quarters two, three, and four of 2020, the city dedicated $112,580 via the Human Services Fund to eviction prevention. Also from a variety of pandemic funding sources, including council contingency funds, CDBG CV dollars, and CARES dollars, the city dedicated $1,457,221 towards eviction prevention. And for 2021, the city has allocated $214,751 from the Human Services Fund for contracts for the remainder of the year, again with providers for rental assistance. Nonetheless, the need is still stark and is unmet by other funding sources. By prioritizing assistance for those impacted by the pandemic to achieve housing stability, residents will be better situated to receive other assistance and make progress. When an individual has a safe, stable home, they are better able to achieve food security, make progress with mental and physical health goals, and access childcare or education for their children. Housing instability has increased throughout the pandemic for many residents and the need for assistance has become even more urgent with the provisions of the governor's eviction bridge proclamation and its upcoming expiration on September the 30th. Next slide, please. While the county is currently operating a rent assistance program, it remains our recommendation to prioritize city dollars for this purpose for a number of reasons. Recent data gathered by city staff has indicated that only approximately three to 4% of the county dollars are actually reaching Bellevue residents. As the data has showed on the previous slide, we have a significant number of Bellevue residents in urgent need now to prevent them from becoming homeless. In addition, the county is operating a lottery system, which requires that residents apply without knowing if they will receive assistance, at times leaving them in limbo and still needing to apply to other agencies. In addition, the county program has a prescribed limit on how much back rent can be paid for a resident. We are still working out the details of a proposed program with legal review, but we are recommending the payment of 100% of back rent to March, 20, uh, March 3rd of 2020 and three months of forward rent for residents who have been impacted by the pandemic. For those residents who may be currently homeless, we are also recommending the payment of 100% of back rent to March 3rd, 2020, and then payment for the move-in costs to their next home. 
The goal is to move the Bellevue residents supported by this program to full housing stability. While it is difficult to estimate the number of households that could be supported by this funding due to the variability in how much is owed in back rent, we would estimate approximately 1,000 households may be served. Throughout the pandemic, at the urging of the council, commission, and staff effort, our human services team has done an excellent job of increasing outreach to providers throughout the multiple RFPs for COVID funding. We now have increased relationships and contracts with providers that will help us reach the communities who have been most impacted by the pandemic, including our residents of color, immigrants, and older adults that we would hope to partner with in order to distribute this funding. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Canedo for his portion of the presentation. Thank you, Tony. Uh, next slide, please. Mayor, Deputy Mayor, members of council, as we thought about the most uh, pressing and immediate needs uh, from the economic development perspective, uh, we've been doing a lot of research to help inform our recommendations tonight. Um, we've been working with our east side neighbors and our regional partners around the workforce, um, and we have discovered that there are about 3,300 unemployed job-seeking Bell viewers at this time. Our unemployment rate continues to be about twice as high as it was uh, pre-pandemic. It has um, it has improved from where it was about this time last year, and you'll hear more about that during the next economic development update. Uh, but there are this is still a significant increase over our usual unemployment numbers here in the city of Bellevue. Um, a couple of months ago, we also took on a consultant in partnership with our east side neighbors from Renton to Bothell to do a study and analysis on the state of back to commercial rents um, in the region. And what we discovered is that there's about 25% of our local property owners who are saying that their commercial tenants are still requesting uh, assistance with paying the rent or making um, um, making arrangements to pay for back to rent. Those most impacted businesses tend to be, and most impacted workers tend to be concentrated in the sectors that are still um, impacted by the low volumes of uh, office workers and visitors in the city. And we know that those uh, those particular populations will take several more months to return to pre-pandemic levels. So the most impacted sectors tend to be personal services, health and wellness, as well as the creative economy. Next slide, please. Based on that, we've come up with two recommendations for the council, the first being half a million dollars for a workforce program. This would be a three-year pilot uh, done in loose cooperation with our neighboring uh, cities on the east side and really focused on providing a navigation program to help our residents access the existing ecosystem of service providers and other resources uh, to help them get the training and other assistance that they need to re-enter the workforce or upskill. So over the three year uh, span of the program, we expect to be able to serve about 2,100 total residents and help 20 businesses create new internship programs in partnership with some of our external partners like the Bellevue Chamber. Uh, we do believe that this will help provide equitable outcomes through the recovery, particularly as uh, those individuals in the sectors most impacted are more likely to be on in lower the income scale and more likely to see their jobs impacted uh, through automation or elimination as the recovery continues. Next slide, please. The other program we're recommending tonight is half a million dollars in small business rent relief. Uh, this is intended to help uh, prevent further closure of small businesses, as particularly those in the uh, aforementioned sectors, personal services, health and wellness, and the creative economy. Um, this program would serve to create about 55 um, grants for local small businesses and help pay any back their back due rent. We expect the average award would be about $9,000 per business, and this would help to ensure that those small locally owned businesses will continue, uh, continue to be functional and provide services for the city of the Bellevue residents, as well as to help preserve their ability to, to keep Bellevueers employed. Um, so that will preserve the number of jobs at local small businesses. And together, the workforce program and the small business program um, will provide the most critical, the critical needs uh, at this time for our small business community. And with that, I'll give it back to Tony. With that, Mayor, we are seeking direction to bring back budget amendments and authorization for contracting up to $8 million of the ARPA, which is about 40% of our total um, uh, receipt of $20 million. Thank you. 
Okay, terrific. Thank you. Can I have a motion to extend the meeting to 1030? So made. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So uh, are there any questions? I can see everybody. If anybody has a question, I see council members on has a question. Go ahead. Yes, uh, well, I actually have two questions. One is on the, the rental assistance, are we going to also do outreach to the small mom and pop landlords as well? So that um, since it looks like we might have 2000 renters that are gonna need assistance and we're gonna be helping half, can we make sure that the small mo mom and pop landlords are are part of that. And then my second question for Jesse is um, on the commercial tenant, you said 25% are experiencing um, the, the gap of, of being able to pay rent. Were the 500K only helps 55 businesses? Can you give me a sense for what that 25% number looks like? Uh, because what I, I just like to understand how many businesses we're helping. And if it doesn't help that many. I would. I wonder if we should be increasing that 500K to a million dollars so that we can help even more small business now because if they can stay in business, they won't be leaving Bellevue. So just wanted to understand that. Those are my two questions. Thank you, Council Members. On I'll take the one um, on the household rental assistance, and then I'll pass it over to, to Jesse for the other question. So, our program um, would uh, invite residents to apply for this assistance. It would not be a landlord assistance program. So, our outreach would be to the tenants and residents. Um, that outreach would primarily occur through the large network of providers we've now formed throughout the community that do have relationships with um, diverse members of our community, individuals we may not have been. Teaching as adequately before. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we only had contracts with five providers for rent assistance, and we, through pandemic funding, have had contracts with 14, um, which really expands our outreach into the community. We would also um, share the information with all of our contracted providers about this opportunity. So even if they are not a rental assistance provider, they um, would have a relationship with our residents in other ways in hopes of reaching the most possible. Okay, thank you. Yes. And council members on regarding the question on uh, the rental relief for small businesses. So the 25% refers to the number of property owners or landlords that are reporting that their tenants uh, are, re are requesting assistance or accommodation with the rent. It was difficult, uh, even through significant, significant work by our consultants and our, our neighbors and partners, it was difficult for us to ascertain the exact number of small businesses that are in arrears at the moment. But we do know that there are about 7,000 total small businesses in the city of Bellevue. Um, so the 55 um, grants is a smaller portion, but it is a significant portion of those small businesses in those three highly impacted sectors, those that are, that are needing the service the most. Okay, so I guess that might be a question for my colleagues about whether at this time we wanna hold back on $1.5 million instead of two and provide more of a potential for small business rental relief. Thank you. Any other questions? Is there a motion to approve this? Yes, Mayor. I move to direct staff to return on August 2nd with appropriate legislation for final action, including budget amendments and authorization to implement council direction, including the use of up to 8 million of ARPA funding. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Madam Mayor, I apologize. When you are saying any questions, I didn't have any questions, but I do have some comments, if I may. Well, no. uh, you, you, I, you know what? I'll tell you what. I ask that we just limit it to questions because we are so crunched for time. If you want to make a comment, then I'm going to let everybody make a comment, and we'll just go as long as we I, need. I, I, I'm willing. So you go to, ahead. Yeah. You want, okay. Thank you. But we've already okay. voted. We've already. I understand. Voted. I understand. That's why I so was. Thinking. Let me. Like, let me just. Like, let me suggestion? just stop you right here. We've already yeah. voted. Let me make I, a suggestion. No. I would love to talk to the. I've been briefed by the staff very well. I like to make some comments, to the staff. Okay, whatever. Okay, let Ms. Thank you. Council Member Lee, I'm going to ask that you do that offline. Yes, I know that. That's why I'm okay. suggesting. 
All right, that'd be great. Thank you. So the uh, motion passes. And I didn't hear any nays, correct? That's correct. Okay. Let's move on to uh, the next one. Uh, Mr. Miyake, would you like to introduce? You know, again, given the hour, uh, Mayor, I'm going to just turn it right over to the team uh, and uh, hand it over to Mac to kind of tee this up for the council. Yeah, thank you, City Manager Miyake. Mayor and Council, we're back this evening with the um, next installment of the 1590 work program discussion. I mean, you all may recall um, that we've had two separate discussions relating to 1590 and how we may go about uh, spending the money uh, that we are now collecting relating to the one tenth of 1% sales tax. We've been discussing most recently human services um, and what a process might look like to distribute human services or said another way, non-capital construction dollars um, and what that might look like. And the council gave direction um, and we issued an RFP for those human services. Um, and then the council you know, has been working on making those awards. Um, now we're turning our attention to the creation uh, of affordable housing units themselves and the capital construction components of the HB 1590 work program. So we're here this evening uh, tonight, if we can flip to the next slide. The specific request this evening is for council to uh, give direction um, so that we can uh, begin to initiate an RFP. And we're gonna be walking through the components of what that RFP may look like. Um, and it specifically relates to priorities and the types of criteria that we would put into the RFP. In the interest of time, we're gonna go through this relatively quickly, but the high level uh, components, uh, council will recall you adopted uh, a policy statement early on in this, identifying which policies that you'd already adopted to give guidance for um, where you may wanna spend the money. And a significant component um, that you also discussed was a uh, component for lack of a better term, local control and how the city council would like to make decisions around spending the 1590 monies. So what we've tried to do is build a process for you all that would involve a funding round where we would put out an application and take in submittals around those highest need priorities on an annual basis. And that process would line up with other funding rounds for affordable and very low income housing, particularly tax credits, uh, state monies, uh, the arch trust fund round and so forth. So. What we plan to do this evening is walk you through how that process might work. Uh, we'll just cover the high level because it was all in your packet around the criteria and the priorities and then loop back to the direction we're hoping to get from council. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, I talked about some of this, we'll go to the next slide. I wanna just put this up. Uh, we have shown this slide at each uh, presentation. Uh, the most important component is that there's a provision in House Bill 1590 that says at least 60% of the funding has to be spent uh, on uh, producing the types of housing that we're talking about here for individuals at or below 60% AMI, and then very specific uh, populations. And we've gone through that at each, each meeting. Uh, the only caveat that I'll note here is there has been an amendment to House Bill 1590 that changed a few of the definitions. Um, and we've given you an update on that uh, and is in your packet. So if we jump to the next slide, I'm gonna hand it off uh, to Ms. Olson who will walk you through the, the work program and then Lindsay Masters will help you with um, how our application process is gonna work and some of the work that art staff will be helping out city staff doing as we bring recommendations to you all on the capital part of this. Great, thank you for that, Mac. Um, good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Council members. I'll be brief. Um, this work plan overview just really speaks to the work that's happened over the last several council study sessions and the stakeholder engagement that's gotten us to this point with the human services RFP and then with this capital RFP. So you'll see on that slide, we're looking for direction on process criteria priorities to um, begin to initiate that RFP. So I will turn it over to Lindsay Masters um, at ARCH to give a presentation on that process. Great, thank you, Liesl. Um, happy to be here. So I'm gonna briefly walk through some of the key components in our process for administering these important new funds, um, some of which you'll be familiar with from your, your ongoing role approving city funds through our trust fund process each year. Um, so if you go to the next slide, 
Um, this gives you a deep dive and I'll walk you step by step through each element in, in the process. Um, the overall approach to this process is that we are trying to complement and to leverage our existing trust fund application round um, while making some really key modifications that give you Bellevue the opportunity to establish your own local priorities, criteria, and direction for the funding. So we'll come back to those uh, later in the presentation. Um, so where we are at is now in the step one, where the council is going to provide some direction on those overall priorities and criteria. Those will be incorporated into an RFP that would be released uh, uh, as soon as we can uh, get it out early in August, if possible. We would then be coinciding with our active funding round, which was announced earlier in June, um, and utilizing the same set of application forms that are well known to affordable housing developers around the state, um, as well as a set of additional supplemental questions that would help us to provide some more detailed analysis on how the proposals fit in with your, with your priorities. Um, from there, ARCH would be conducting a very similar review and analysis that we do for all of the funding applications we already receive, um, looking at things like financial feasibility, the capacity of the organizations, and preparing um, that sort of staff report for discussion by an interdepartmental staff review team. Um, and the idea here is that we'll be timing this again to coincide with our ongoing funding round so that we can uh, share information from that process um, and, and with the goal to align our analysis and our, and our recommendations at the end of the day. Um, the other kind of key component in the interdepartmental staff team is that we're really trying to create a more robust set of coordination within the city, um, particularly as we look ahead towards integrating those processes for allocating service dollars that may have other ongoing uh, implications and operational considerations with the upfront capital recommendations. So really trying to, to beef that up. Um, and so we'd be bringing in representatives from not only community development, but also parks and community services, the city's homelessness outreach coordinator and potentially development services as well. Um, so that's a, a really important distinction from the ARCHES process, which again relies on an appointed citizen advisory board um, of, of other experts in housing and our own executive board to finalize those recommendations. So we would form that as a staff team uh, for the review of the department director. We would approve that and send it for your consideration, again, in that same time frame that we would be also delivering to you a set of recommendations for the trust fund. Um, and that happens in the recommendations are finalized in December and come to you in that first quarter of 2022. The next steps five uh, from five to six and seven would look very similar to what you are used to. The functions ARCH has provided for the city for many years in helping to develop and execute contracts, administer all the expenditures, um, and perform that ongoing monitoring of the projects. We would also be feeding data and information um, to the city to help inform your ongoing reporting on the program. Make sure you've got the necessary information to review how it's going and make adjustments as you need. And that would be designed to uh, dovetail with your ongoing reporting on the affordable housing strategy. So that's a whole lot um, packed into one slide. And I wanna kind of shift to the next slide where we talk about some of the key benefits of creating this process. Um, so considerations that went into this, one, we got a lot of feedback from the development community and stakeholders about trying to create a streamlined process. And so supporting um, as much over, overlay into the existing ARCH funding round process as possible. Um, but we also really felt it was important, again, to give you an explicit point to establish your set of local priorities um, and you, you want to prioritize with this funding. So that's what we're doing tonight. Um, and again, you get to leverage everything we've already established over the last three decades in funding projects um, through the trust fund program. So you have staff with affordable housing expertise. You have a process that leverages uh, other funding through our advocacy uh, for Eastside projects. 
you have all the monitoring and contracting systems set up. So it's just a matter of kind of making sure those scale to the funding. Um, and then in addition, we are really, again, adding that in more integrated, uh, robust coordination between staff with various expertise within the city on homelessness and human services and planning. So the next couple slides are gonna walk through the criteria. I won't cover each one of these, um, but suffice to say, these, are, these criteria were developed from both a couple of key things, your interest statement uh, from early on in the process where you articulated the things that are important to you, um, as well as several of the criteria that we've learned through our existing funding process are our basic uh, key important things that we feel are important to look at. Um, so we can maybe go to the next slide, which captures the remainder, and I'm happy to answer any questions about how we apply these in practice. I think with, with that, um, we can move on to your part, Liesl, in wrapping up what the summary of, of what we've discussed so far, the criteria. Great, thanks for that, Lindsay. So as it's, as it's been mentioned, um, as staff work to continue to build this long-term process to allocate both capital and services funding, we know that there are high priority housing needs that are happening in Bellevue right now. And so similar to the human services RFP, we're looking to issue this capital funding RFP in order to quickly get funding out into the community because we know that there are projects in the pipeline. So we're looking, um, again, like Lindsay spoke to, to use the ARCH process with Bellevue specific modifications to meet those local needs in order um, to provide funding for the capital costs of constructing or acquiring affordable housing. This request for proposal would be um, for up to $6 million. As you've uh, heard at previous council study sessions, 20% of the funding from House Bill 1590 um, was allocated towards the Human Services RFP funding. And the remainder of this funding was anticipated to be used for capital funding. And then, so that's how we've arrived at the number for the RFP that you see tonight. The next two slides um, go into some of the housing needs data that informed our funding priorities. I'll go through these next two slides pretty quickly. Basically, we're working to evaluate the current and future housing needs and identify those gaps in housing supply um, that we see in Bellevue. Um, this is something that we've spoken to before. We're seeing that biggest gap in housing supply at the zero to 30% area median income level, where we have the most households represented at 10% but only 3% of the housing units can actually serve this income range. And so it's signif significantly underserving these households both here and across the region. The next slide also speaks to an important, important consideration, which is um, the number of cost burdened households in Bellevue. And so from our most recent data, almost one third of Bellevue households were cost burdened, meaning they spent more than 30% of their income on housing um, severely cost burdened households spend more than 50% of their income on housing. And this um, number for households at the zero to 30% AMI level jumps up to nearly three out of four households. And so at this point, it is very challenging to maintain that stable housing for severely cost burdened households. So between that and assessment of housing need and our continued conversations with stakeholders, the following funding priorities on the screen are what are recommended for the capital RFP. The first one is addressing and preventing homelessness and housing instability. We believe that this funding can really help support those different needs that individuals and households may require to obtain and maintain their stable housing. The second priority is addressing individuals and households who are earning um, the zero to 30% AMI level, because as, I, as we just showed, that's where really the greatest housing need is and where um, existing sources of funding are insufficient to meet the need. The third funding priority is really focusing on our underserved and vulnerable residents. By keeping this priority area broad, we're ensuring that this funding can support all of the eligible populations under the RCW and that council can, council can be flexible in um, serving the various and different needs that each population may need in terms of housing and services. So the next slide just um, shows in a little more detail the anticipated RFP schedule. 
So to coincide with ARCH's fall funding round, we would issue the RFP in early to mid-August um, with applications due at the end of September. Staff would work on a recommendation through the interdepartmental staff review team that Lindsay mentioned with um, the funding recommendation coming to council in that first quarter of 2022. We believe that by using ARCH's process elements with the Bellevue specific modifications, Council has a role in reviewing and approving those final recommendations and ensuring that these projects meet those funding priorities, um, priority areas and Bellevue considerations. So with that, I will turn it back over um, to Mac to wrap up our presentation for this evening. Yeah, thanks, um, Liesl. As, as we're wrapping up here, we can go ahead and flip to the next slide. The request uh, from Council tonight is, um, to think about and if you're comfortable with the criteria as we've laid them out there and the priorities based on all your discussions to date uh, and the stuff that we put in your packet to give us direction to initiate the RFP along those lines. We know there are still some ongoing discussions. You just had a discussion much earlier tonight about what a potential set of conditions may look like. Um, you know, those are discussions, uh, the condition or the award itself wouldn't happen for at least six months, um, probably, depending on how the submittal, we could get the quickly get the RFP out on the street and then get submittals in and then evaluate them and bring them back to council. So um, the timing should line up, even if you, whatever you decide next week, relative to those other uh, things you were talking about earlier. Our request tonight uh, is to try to get the RFP put together and out on the street. Uh, to catch uh, as wide a net as we could at can, but to give guidance that the priorities are based on the highest need as exists right now. And I think the other point that I'll, I'll leave you all with is uh, priorities can change year to year, and it would be our intent each year when we get ready to talk about a new funding round and what that might look like to come back to you all and talk to you all about what we're seeing um, and what we're hearing from different stakeholders and where the priority need may be year to year. For right now, this is clearly what we're hearing and what we're seeing in the empirical data. And so that's the basis of our recommendation. So I'll go ahead and stop there, Mayor. And if there are questions of myself or any of the staff, we're happy to answer those. Well, I just want to thank staff for speeding through these last two presentations after waiting so long for your chance to present. I can only imagine how hard that is. Um, great presentation. Uh, so the direction we're trying to give staff is whether or not to initiate the RFP and also, if we were to do that, what kind of uh, priorities and criteria should they incorporate into the RFP? So I'm going to give everybody a chance to comment or ask questions and or. And uh, go ahead and I see Council Member Lee. I see Council Member Zahn. I see Stokes. Okay, go ahead, Council Member Lee, you can start off. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I do have some questions. Uh, you know, uh, we, we, do we have anything that consider include mental health and uh, especially for young people because the disruption they've had, you know, in this uh, pandemic and, um, and also, you know, address uh, diverse population, you know, how can we uh, use uh, more efficient outreach to uh, diversity service providers? Uh, in you know these areas of outreaching and getting to uh, the 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 target that we are interested in. Uh, I think if if I might, Council Member Lee, there was a couple things in there. One was about service providers, and the other about um, uh, equity and and how we reach a broad, diverse population of would be uh, um, in this case developers. On the first and part, then also it, mental health specifically and to young people. Right. And so as we talk about this, the the request this evening is to look solely at the construction or capital side of the funding stream. The mental health components and or human service components, or let's just say general service, um, is handled right now through our human services group and through the human services commission. And you've gotten a presentation on that in the last couple of weeks. We have significantly more demand than we currently have money allotted for that. What we're likely to see when we put this RFP on the street is there's significantly more demand than there is monetary resources for the capital construction as well. 
Um, I don't know that yet, but we are talking to people who are all looking to access the money at this time. Okay, uh, Council Member Zahn. Yes, actually, this is what I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, last week, what we saw with the mental health was that we we got our proposals for 3.3 million, but only 1.6 was available. For capital, we're talking about $6 million. When we first voted this in, we talked about the fact that, well, first of all, I agree with the priority, I agree with the process, and I agree with the criteria. So let's start there. But I would add that when, when I voted for this, when we voted for this, we talked about the fact that we have a unique opportunity to bond against future revenues so that if we actually got proposals for well over $6 million, I really recommend to my colleagues that we don't wait until the next year for a funding cycle because um, you know real estate is only getting more expensive and so we need to be moving with more urgency. So I would like to understand from staff what it would take to um, look at being able to bond against future revenues. Is that an analysis that we need Tony Call to do? And if that's the case, um, can that be added to this particular request or do I need to add that in as a separate request next week? So council members on, on the question of issuing debt, um, which is an option for the city, we can issue debt for up to half of the revenue stream. Uh, what we are proposing to do is build a debt issuance question into the 2022 work program. So an idea around early wins and looking at the 1590 funding stream for right now um, was the preferred option to recommend to you for lots of reasons. And we're hearing a tremendous need to be able to access the money right now. And it's probably, uh, it's a several month process um, to, to be able to queue up the machine to issue debt. So the actual uh, departments involved, my department in community development and Tony Call's department, along with some legal analysis um, to be able to issue that debt. So we've already got it queued up for the work plan. I think the question you're asking is in terms of timing, if we see a dramatic um, need or desire to access the money now, that's actually a pretty important question to whether or not we wanna look hard at a debt issuance. So we'll probably be in a better question to, uh, or better place to answer your question. Um, once we see what comes in from the RFP um, solicitation. And if we get that kind of demand, we probably will want to talk to you all about what a debt issuance may look like. And that would be in September is when we would know then, is that right? Um, we're still working on how long the RFP would be out on the streets, but sometime, yes, in the or very early fall. Okay, so I'd just like to make sure that that's something on our work plan and accelerated if possible. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to extend the meeting to 10.45? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, uh, Council Member Stokes. Um, I think it's fine. I really appreciate all the work you've gone into. It's very thoughtful. Um, it's, um, you know, it's it's complex and, and we don't have the... We could use a lot more money, but I think you've done an excellent job of putting it together and, and all. So I'm, I'm ready to have it brought back to vote on. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there anybody else? Uh, okay, I see Council Member Robertson. I saw a thumbs up from Council Member Barksdale and I see a thumbs up from Deputy Mayor. So Council Member Robertson, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, no, I wanted to come back and vote on it. I just, um, on the RFP criteria, um, I saw, I wanted to emphasize two things that I really particularly liked and ask about something I think is missing. Um, and that is the citywide approach, the geographic distribution of housing opportunities across Bellevue. I think that's really great. I talk a lot about dispersion. There's mm -hmm. two kinds of dispersions though, and this is only one. The other type of dispersion is having the affordable um, units mixed in with different um, income rates. So I think that we should be definitely contacting people who are building towers today and letting them know that they can apply to have some grant funding to turn some of their units into permanent affordable housing. I think that that would be a great opportunity. We could really leverage it. And that goes with the partnerships. I think partnerships where we can have work with people who are doing, you know, fee developers, we're going to get a lot more bang for our buck. 
uh, and create a lot more units much more quickly if we do that. So um, I'd love to have a uh, Mac or whomever's response to that, if that is something that we will be able to focus on uh, as we get responses to the RFP. Um, and otherwise, I'm so tired it being on Zoom this long, I'm ready to vote. But I want to hear from Mac first. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Roberts. And yes, we've been um, testing that in the marketplace about mixed income buildings and what it might take to go from um, 80 percent AMI, which is very typical workforce affordable housing type of unit or subsidy down to 60 or down to 30. It's not, uh, I would say, from our, our feedback so far, a tried and true business model, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. And so part of it may be a marketing campaign to find the right developers that are willing to entertain taking that on, and then it becomes a numbers discussion, which we're happy to do. So what we intend to do is build that in um, to say that that's absolutely possible and that please submit if you're in that category and then try to reach the right people. Because uh, I think as everyone on the council knows, there's certain developers that, that that's just not their business model and they may not be interested. But for those that are, they need to know that they can access this money. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, of course, uh, there's a, you know, a cost to that as well. And we can help you all with once we get the submittals, what's the best bang for the buck in terms of total number of units, total cost subsidy per unit, and that, that kind of sort of thing. But to answer your question, yes, we plan to build that into the RFP. Wonderful. Let's move ahead. So, yeah, and, and you just brought up exactly what I wanted to bring up as well. So thank you. And I'll just take it a little further. Lindsay, I wanted to ask you, of uh, what percentage of zero to 30% AMI earners uh, require supportive housing? <laughs> sure, I can't answer that off the top of my head, um, but I think if you look at the numbers countywide um, and you try to scale that down to Bellevue, the number of zero to 30% AMI households is huge. Um, I don't think the majority of those need supportive housing but they do need deeply affordable housing. Okay, so I, I would really like to include in what Council Member Robertson is suggesting that we look at ways to mix in unsupported housing needs of zero to 30 into all, so that we have a full spectrum of affordabilities mixed into these um, developments if possible. I know that's hard, but we've got money that we've never had before. And we I've always heard developers say, if the city could contribute something to us, we could do, we could lower the rents. And so this is an opportunity, I think, to do that. So I'd love to look mm -hmm. at um, the potential of buying down rents in that range uh, along, you know, with at least 80% AMI, if not market rate, I don't know what's possible, but I'm really not interested in building buildings, lots of buildings of this range and other buildings of this range. I think, you know, Bellevue has been very successful in mixing affordabilities and I'd really like to encourage us to continue to do so. So that would be my goal. Uh, any, any more questions or comments? No comment. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, is there a motion? Indeed, Mayor. I move to direct staff to initiate a request for proposals process to identify affordable housing capital development opportunities to fund with HB 1590 funds. Second. And all, the, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, great. I want to thank the entire council for working so hard tonight and staff and Mr. Miyake. I mean, this has been a very substantive night and I know it's been uh, tough for everybody and everybody's given it their all. So I just want to thank you all very much and wish you a good night. <laughs> Meeting adjourned. Good night. Bye.